please. Okay, one of the issues <clears throat> that I heard quite a bit about this summer uh, was school bus safety. And uh, it seems to be a pro problem all over the state with people passing school buses. And um, I know I just talked to my superintendent yesterday or the day before. It's a, it's a statewide issue, I guess, of people passing buses during when they're stopped and caution and red and going over the sidewalks. And, and I didn't know if there was something we should be doing or could be doing before a disaster strikes. That just scares me. I don't know. There's so many close calls that I've heard about. And uh, so I thought when I got back here this, this session, see if we could do something or uh, just address the issue, whether there's anything can be done. I don't know what our penalties are. I don't know. I know there's, I don't know how much more clear you can make, but caution, you step in, the red's going to come on. and. Uh, so maybe you could help me or help us committee understand what's happening. Certainly, Senator. Um, for the record, uh, Colonel Jake Elver, I'm the director of DMV's Enforcement Safety Division. With me is Patrick McMiniman. Pat is our a, uh, a program specialist sp focused on pupil transportation. And I'll let Spat, uh, Pat speak to, he sits on two national committees as well. <coughs> so just a little background, Pat was with the Wellington Police Department and then actually I recruited him. He worked for the DMV's Commercial Vehicle Enforcement for a number of years before he uh, retired out of that unit and became a program specialist. Um, just before I have Pat speak, just a little background though, Senator, you're not the only one that's asking us questions about it. Representative Townsend from South Burlington has also approached us. I believe Anthea has a bill that she's been working on with some um, suggestions. We've been uh, communicating with her and reviewing it as well. But I think what I'll do is turn over to Pat and let Pat kind of give you kind of a snapshot of what, what's occurring in Vermont, what we're doing with school bus safety, and kind of give you an okay. idea of where we are. So, so I'm Pat McMahon. Um, as the Colonel said, I'm the program specialist who specializes in student transportation. Um, I sit on uh, well, I'm president elect for the National Association of State Directors for Pupil Transportation. We re represent the 51 state, well, the 50 states plus DC, um, plus forum. We have some forum members um, that are my counterpart throughout the US. Um, and then I also am the chair for the National Congress on Student Transportation, which meets every five years. They set, they, um, set the manual for procedures and standardizations for student transportation. Some states adopt it totally, some states use it as a reference guide, some of the states will adopt some of it and use the rest as a reference guide. Here in Vermont we use it as mostly a reference guide, but the new inspection manual has adopted the inspection procedure out of there. I can tell you that our <clears throat> procedures for that we teach in our school bus clinic for stopping and loading and unloading is the best practice that is seen throughout the U.S. The only difference is where um, they have the bus, the best practice for the national standards is they pull to the right, they put on the right turn signal and pull to the right. We can't do that here in Vermont. If we did, we'd be dumping the kids into either a, a snow bank or over the embankment of a road. Um, so we have them maintain the road, um, delay the travel when they drop off their students. Other than that, we follow the best practice as far as what we teach at our school bus clinic. Drivers are required to take the school bus clinic. It's an eight-hour clinic <clears throat> taught by 21 inst um, instructors that are certified by us. Um, and the clinic is standardized. They are um, they're taught on the procedure. Um, and then they're tested on it. Um, initially, when they get the endorsements, they have to do a written test and they have to do the driving test where they are actually tested on the procedure. Every four years, they, uh, when they come up for renewal, they have to retake the clinic and they're retested on the written test. If our examiner feels that they need to do a driving test, they can request the driving test after that. Um, but we don't automatically retest them on the driving ability. So that's a, a background of how we do our training here for our drivers. Um, is the problem with school bus drivers or the other drivers on the road? Yes, I think you were here last year. We had um, 
a woman who spoke. Um, I think it was Becky Conch uh -huh. from um, Maryland and Northeast. Right, um, who spoke about some of the experiences and some recommendations <coughs> relative to maybe how signals were located on the bus and so forth. And then the other question we had was how does this tie into the governor's highway safety um, plan and the extent to which, because it is a huge safety issue for children, um, how their, um, their plan of action would respond to what we see as a fairly significant um, risk. And um, so I'm just trying to pick up from where we had this last year because um, uh, their description of what they experience as drivers every day was just appalling. It, it is when you hear about the specific ones, and, and any child that is hit is a tragedy. I, I'm not going to minimize that. Um, but in Vermont, we are actually below the national average. Um, the national average is up in the 77% range of drivers reporting vehicles passing them. Last year, we take part in the, the NASDEPS um, national survey, red light passing survey every year. And last year, we were at 13% of our drivers who reported to us um, having a passing. Like at least one incident? At or? least one incident, yes. Um, and actually, the incidents are, I counted every incident as well, an actual passing. Point. I didn't take a driver and say, OK, you have five incidents. That's just one driver. It's oh, OK. okay. Um, last year was also the best return I had. Um, when in, in 2016, I had 45 drivers report. Last year, I had 315. So it's a huge jump. Um, from, of course, that doesn't account for every driver. <laughs> and then I'm trying to, to slowly get them on board. Um, but as far as the lights are concerned, Becky has, has done a um, pilot program where she has placed red lights at eye level on the front and the rear of the bus um, on a couple of her most um, severe routes where they saw the bulk of the passing. She doesn't have exact numbers, but what the drivers are telling her are that the passings have actually gone down in that case. Um, I was showing the colonel and talking to the colonel about it. Ohio has done a similar thing where they put four lights in the grill and they alternate. Mm -hmm. um, they are yellow initially, and when the red lights come on, they turn the red. And then on the back of the bus, they have um, striped it like you would see on the back of an ambulance or fire truck, um, as well as at, the, at some extra lights. Um, they've also started, this was done in Columbus, and they've also started to see a decline. So I think the problem is not necessarily the way we train. Um, I think the problem is distraction. It's people not recognizing the bus is stopping until it's too late. Um, you, then, am I mistaken? One time they used to have an arm that went down. Is that? They have a stop sign that comes out. Yeah, but was there an arm that went down one time? No. There is. There is a company that makes a huge arm that yeah. comes down with a stop sign on it. Yeah. Um, my concern with that is, and it, it's on breakaway points, but my concern was, would you're gonna be, break it off. you're going to break it off, and are you going to be causing a more of an issue? Because now the person's lost control. Um, but they do have the stop signs, and the arm you typically see comes out to make the child walk 10 right. feet from the front mm -hmm. of the bus, which is what we train. Um, so I, I think the bulk of the issue is that distraction and not recognizing that the bus has stopped. But you got the caution to come on early. Right. Who turns that off? The driver? The driver. And, and like, like a second, two seconds You have before. to give people a little warning. We have to, to give them a warning. Yeah. We train at least 200 feet, okay. five to 10 seconds out from the stop. So that could actually be up to 666 feet going at 45 miles an hour. Okay. Um, so that's what we train. If there's a particular problem with that stop, to put them on even earlier. Right. So if there's a turn. Like yeah. yeah. Um, so we take all that into account when we do our training. Um, but it, it comes down to, again, it's it's that that driver. It's it's the behavior of the driver. It's not. I don't think it's a training issue. I don't think it is um, the notification by the driver. I think it's actually a behavior issue. You know, it's either distraction or some people just don't care. Or they're in a rush and they don't yeah. want to stop. Right. Now the other thing I heard there's cameras available. Did 
take pictures of people that go through. Is that, is that something that every state does? They do with themselves or the bus company puts them on or what? The bus provider puts them on um, depending on the state. For instance, the state of South Carolina, they buy all, the state owns all the school buses that are used in South Carolina. Um, and I believe they are now starting to install cameras. The cameras take a picture of the license plate, is that what they do? Some will take a picture of the license plate and the driver, some will just take a picture of the license plate in the car. It depends on how the system is set up. Montgomery County, Maryland has a program where a company came in and they have installed um, cameras <coughs> right now 50% of their buses. And what happens is it, it takes a picture the Montgomery County Police, they have somebody that reviews it, the cameras, or the, the film, or the DVDs, and they issue a ticket to the registered owner based on that film. Um, the fine is lower than what it would be if they actually caught the driver and there's no points assessed to it. If the person wants that ticket wiped off their record, they don't want to pay it, then they have to submit who was actually driving the vehicle so that the officer can then issue a ticket for the full amount to that person. Then the company that has installed these tickets, or these cameras, it didn't cost Montgomery County anything. The company gets a percentage of the fee to pay for the camera setups. Montgomery County is actually looking at installing it in all their buses now. Is um, that effective, you think, the, the cameras? Or? From what I hear from, um, Todd and Leon, who are the director and the um, assistant director for their transportation, that has had some effect. So, um, and that's one of the problems with our issues, or our, our state, is it's hard to get a conviction because you have to be able to identify the driver and the vehicle. Right. Um, and even with that, um, they're not being, they're not being uh, found guilty of it because of the technicality. Um, I can tell you of one case in Rutland where the officer couldn't testify that the school bus sign was the proper size and that the front fenders were black, which is required by our state law, and the hearing officer dismissed the ticket. Wow. <laughs> so I have another case where the, if, I'm, are you aware of the taxi cabs that have the school bus signs? Mm -hmm. Okay. They don't fall under the definition of a school bus. Um, but they have to have the sign and the driver has to have a school bus endorsement. And they follow the same procedures. Um, where a car passed, the school bus driver was able to identify everything, called the local police department, and the law enforcement officer that arrived said, it doesn't meet the definition of a school bus, therefore 1283 doesn't apply. Um, and that's what we're dealing with, is, is the actual enforcement issues. So should we um, think about a statutory change for those vehicles are transporting students, um, and, but we have a more, much more narrow definition of what's a school bus? I, I think we need to look at, should we somehow include them a lot of places where we say a school bus may be ad or vehicles um, that are marked in accordance with for right, that's what I'm wondering yeah. whether I mean we have the dis um, miscellaneous DMV bill here so we have an opportunity to um, address some you know depending on what your recommendations are um, I mean ideally the best thing is public awareness right. and um, uh, and trying to get people you know to um, be particularly sensitive when they see a school bus. I couldn't believe on the news that school bus driver got shot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, how did you see it? Well, well he, yeah. I, I guess yeah. it was bad weather and he sort of bumped another car and the guy got just very irate and shot him um, several times. Um, it was out in the Midwest, Ohio yes, or something. Was, I think, uh, I think it's yeah. correct, it was Ohio. Um, um, so, to, to answer your question on the awareness of it, uh, Senator, we, we did this last year. Governor's Highway Safety actually uh, produced a PSA. Yeah, after we had this discussion, <laughs> uh, we noticed that, yeah. in fact, there had been some. And, and that's been in regular circulation. I've seen it a number of times in the, over the period of time, actually, recently, I think, is the last couple of weeks. So um, 
it is in rotation. Um, as Pat said, I think certainly awareness. Uh, um, we've talked about distraction. That certainly is an issue out there for everybody, not just school buses, but first responders, V trans plows. Um, I think from the enforcement side, as Pat has indicated, it is an issue for us. Is, um, and I think one of the things Pat would say is, you know, when you have a school bus and you're trying to identify, you know, you have a car that's passing, you have the driver that has really should be, is focusing on his students. Where are my students versus, you know, I'm trying to get a look at the driver so I can identify. Yeah. So yeah, it, that would be, if you were looking at the two that type of enforcement, it would need to be some kind of statutory change. I, I know we've talked about it with like red light cameras or speed cameras. Is if you were to issue, I mean, it's really issuing the registered owner. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, we've heard the argument, well, then you're forcing the person to give up. I mean, it, we've had mm -hmm. those discussions. But I think if you talk to law enforcement, that's probably the most difficult thing is receiving the case after the fact, um, getting a statement from the bus driver, trying to identify it, and then if the, the person will tell you who the driver is, it really makes it difficult for the prosecution. Um, yeah. On a safety note, uh, when I was coming up here, um, their school bus stopped right in Killington on Route 4. The two lanes going up, and both, and it's to beat the bus is the game. You know, you can see it, and the two lanes on to the right. And then before the bus could put, or maybe the same time or close to it, I can't even remember how the light's on, there was an undercover, unmarked uh, cruiser, and hit the blue lights and that brought the traffic right down. Now I know we can't do that at every school bus, but it was on Route 4 and it's two lanes. That I'm sure those cars in the left lane would have passed that bus, even if those lights were on. So that was just surprised everybody, surprised me. I said, ah, good one, good to go, you know. But every once in a while, if they could follow. Uh, what do they do, for example, let's say you're heading uh -uh. I would say up, up the mountain, and there's, there's, they're they picking up kids that would have to cross multiple lanes on that section of Route 4. In other words, if the bus is in the right-hand side heading, is that north at that point, or east, or whatever? You're wondering whether the third lane. To direct yeah. all, there's all lanes the kids, have to stop? And the kids were over on the other side. Would they actually have those kids cross? Uh, I'm that? not sure, but I know that there was a bunch of cars with you know, waiting for the students to get on the bus. So I'm thinking that, you know, maybe if they were from across the street, they drove them over on that. Oh, I, so would, I sure. think that would be particularly dangerous so if they were cro having to cross They probably the picked them up on the way back or something. Yeah. Best practice that we, we teach for setting up stops is that in a, a multiple four-lane roadway, or three-lane roadway for that matter, where the child would have to cross multiple lanes, not just the one lane, um, then you go up, you come back down. Also on roads that are dangerous, for instance, Route 15 in Johnson, um, they actually go down one way and then they turn around and come back and pick up the kids on the opposite side. Um, that's what best practice is, that's what we teach. But it's up to, because it's not statutorily how you do it, it's up to the provider to make the best route decision for them. So. Most places I know of will not have them cross multiple lanes. If it is, as far as stopping, if it is a multiple lane road that has a, a divider in it, a, a mm -hmm. su substantial divider, like um, Route 7 in the Burlington, South Burlington area is a prime example, um, where there's that divider, the bus going south stops, northbound traffic would not have to stop because there's that divider. That's what we're seeing a lot in schools now, putting in bus lanes because of that issue, where they will have a divider dividing the bus lane from the traffic, because what happens is technically, if there's not that divider in there, any traffic that is there must come to a stop. Um, so like on that Rutland report, all three lanes, oh, well, the, the bus is in one lane, the other two lanes even come the other way are supposed to stop. Yes. Right. So I wonder if that's how, much, how often they just don't even know they're supposed to stop. If there's a lane between them and the bus, they might not. If they're coming the other way, they might. People might not know that. And it's the same in every state, right? Um, it's pretty so. standard in every state, yes. 
because we have a lot of folks from out of state. Yep. Um, my gut is it's the same throughout the U.S., but I can find out that answer by just surveying that the NASDAQ's members. And is the training of the bus driver one thing that was helpful on a route that I used to ride with my kids in the morning? We would get behind a bus, but the bus driver would always pull off. There was a little pull off just ahead. So you'd slow down because they would pick up four stops, but you knew they were going to pull over. So it was a little easier to, to wait. In our public relations part of our training, <laughs> um, we actually mentioned that. That's one of the things we mentioned that, you know, so that other drivers are right. impatient after right because there would be you know, 12 up. cars lined up behind them and we could all pass yeah so we do we do mention that i know i i try every um at least every three years to hit each one of my instructors um to watch them in a clinic and it might be i might notify them on coming or it might be a surprise mm -hmm. <laughs> so um but I, I i have a checklist to make sure that they are following the curriculum that we're have prescribed and the curriculum just didn't come from me it came from a committee of four of our um, instructors that are experienced drivers and trainers um, that got together and came up with the curriculum they don't when they come to a stop they don't go straddle the center line to the buses so they stop both traffic was that no we tell them to maintain their lane okay. um, what I have heard yeah. is some of the buses now are starting to pull to and at an angle the problem with that is you're reducing the visual right, of the lights. Right, right, right. And the sign. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's always a some, you know, trick somewhere. You're just trying to figure out a way that's going to be safe because, boy, sooner or later we hear the complaints. But uh, it doesn't seem like fines are the issue because you never no, get a case to. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the window of time, it's difficult to. Uh, we tried doing an event uh, a year ago up in Colchester and we lined up a number of unmarked cruisers. There was a complaint up near St. Michael's College. That's a four lane highway, two lanes each way. And they were getting complaints and we're all set up, ready to go. And the day we set up, we find out the student actually left this district. And, 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 and it, so, it, you know, it, it's hard when you're trying to plan or, you know, and, uh, being, or, or the route is just such a short uh, period of time that, um, it makes it difficult right. uh, to, to make arrangements. So what can we do? Yeah, what are any thoughts that you'd like that we could? Um, I, I think I would let Pat, I, and when we were asked to come over, I think it was you had some concerns and wanted to hear what concerns. I think uh, it would be good, helpful to Pat to take a look at what the other states, like he had mentioned, coming over just about the lighting. Um, the, the first question I usually hear, you heard it with like the ideas about having seat belts on school buses. What's the impact to the school districts? What's the additional cost to the providers and such? But um, you know, markings, those are certainly not as expensive. I mean, we've the, the school buses, if you look at the school buses now, nowadays when you hit them at night, they have the outlines where the emergency doors are and the right, emergency right, windows right. are. Yeah. So um, that's part of the business and just conspicuity. Um, so I think if we could take a look, um, again, um, we're also reviewing what Anthea has sent to us from uh, Representative Townsend as well. Um, I believe in that one, one of the comments or suggestions was increasing or at least laying out the actual distance where amber lights were to be activated um, and when red lights, um, so, uh, but you have that in training, you said. It has it in training, but it isn't laid out statutorily in that. Um, in one of the conversations Pat and I had is that should we be saying an absolute like distance? Because when you say an absolute number, it makes it difficult for law enforcement. We had that issue when we were talking about vulnerable users. How does an officer know what's three feet versus yeah. four feet right, right. when they're or passing? 60 feet or 50 feet. And as you said, depending on road conditions, sometimes you actually want to turn the amber on uh, for a longer distance. Right. So and, and what Pat has suggested is do we use like seconds? It's easier to go 1,001, yeah. 1,002 from a distance counting as opposed to trying to say, here's, right. the, here's the measure and stick of what the distance is. So that, that, that takes into account how fast the bus is going. And um, 
forgot that question, but I had another idea that I know Senator Mazel like if we add one blue light to the back. <laughs> <laughs> Senator, I don't want I don't want to issue a plan light permit. I've said this a number of times in committee. <laughs> Very yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, right up there with dirty air. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Making friends everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we all want to do the, what's best, but it's very difficult to come up with what is best. Uh, oh, I have remembered my question. Yeah. So do we know if the problem is more people passing, you know, counter tra traffic or passing bus? I would assume it's coming the other way, but I uh, I can actually give you those. Uh, Nationally, they are seeing 59%, 59.1% passing from the front and 40.9% passing from the rear. In Vermont, in 16, we saw 41% passing from the front and 58 passing from the rear. 86% um, in 2017 passing from the front and 13% passing from the rear. And then in last year, we saw 70% passing from the front and 29% passing from the rear. But again, this is a small, small segment of the actual transportation. Um, as I get more and more people involved or more and more drivers involved in it, um, I'm going to get a better picture of what's actually happening in Vermont, and then we can keep better track of it. Um, but here it's, it's, you know, 2017 we saw a huge front passing and not so much of the rear. But I had 147 drivers respond back then. So let me ask, sometimes when they just turn on that amber light, you can't stop. It's a warning, right? That the red light? That they're about to turn uh, on. Right? You can pass if it's you the can. Or can At this you point, know. legally, yes, if the yellows are on. Um, the, one of the issues I have by absolutely saying you can't is that if they're at the Flint Theater or they're lining up for a track and field right, event, they, the they have them yeah. on. So that, that would back up traffic terribly if they yeah. were, if vehicles could be yeah. passed. Yeah, when they're loading, unloading, you see that. Once they but load you don't, But you can't stop the <clears throat> same instant that the, or right. the yellow amber light goes on. That's what I'm saying. Is you need, I yeah. stop when the amber light is on. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going by well, it. I agree with that, but I'm just saying sometimes you're coming and it's just going on and you you right. can't come around the corner. Yeah. 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 Let me clarify, are you talking about vehicles coming towards you? Yeah. Okay. The vehicles passing you coming towards you that we've gotten reported once the red lights are on. Oh. Okay. The passing occurs when the red lights are on. So the drivers don't report if it's during the yellow yeah. lights. Okay. Yeah. So yes. Alright, well. So there's, other than just trying to get better public awareness and, Market. I mean, it, it's very hard to legislate common sense. Right. We say um, that all the time with and seat some, And we talk about, particularly, and with texting. Texting, and, seat belts, everything um, else. Yeah. Personally, uh, on the enforcement side of it, it would really help to, to make the, the key being able to prove the case a little bit easier via the using cameras. Um, and as well as also, um, because it's hard for the driver to identify the driver of the, the vehicle, um, possibly looking at issuing to the registered owner, um, at least we're gonna start putting the impact on drivers. Because as a parent, if it was one of my kids and I got a ticket as a registered owner, yeah, I might not turn my kid in because I'm looking at mm -hmm. the increase in the insurance that I'm right, going to be yeah, paying, right. you might have but I'm going to have a nice conversation with my kid sure. um, with a penalty that they're going to, right. not only to find, but they're going to have a penalty at home. Um, so I think possibly maybe looking at that, something that in the same way some other states have started to look. Let me go outside the box just a minute and say, okay, what about, we heard this discussion since someone's been here a long time about seat belts on school buses and I know that's been up and down and I've heard testimony of why not why for or against is that going anywhere is it I mean people say well how come you don't have school buses uh, seat belts and for the same reason who's going to enforce it and all the other things that goes with it but there are many states have primary enforcement on seat belts. There, 
what's happening, um, we saw last year two states have mandated um, three point seatbelts on. So we're now up to, I believe, a total of nine states that require the, Really? Nine states at that time? That require three point seatbelts. Um, California has the most, um, they've had it the longest. They've actually have seen a decrease in um, discipline issues on the bus. But the interesting thing is they've done a study of single vehicle school bus crashes prior to seatbelts and single vehicle school bus crashes after seatbelts, and they've seen a decrease. And the reason is, is the driver's not distracted by the kids in the back I'm because moving around. they're now seatbelted in. One of the things I heard years ago, we had one of the main areas we had, who would be responsible for the kids being buckled up? The driver didn't yeah. came up and down the aisle and say, wow, you're not buckled, you're buckled. And so, but you know, I've been asked that, I'm sure others have, but why, we have to put seatbelts on, why don't kids have school buses? I just wondered how that, yeah. So what California, I refer to California because I think they have the most comprehensive one, and what they do with their drivers is as long as the driver reminds the student when they are boarding the bus okay. to put their seatbelt on, they are held harmless okay. if something happens. Okay. Um, even if the child injures another child, the driver is held harmless because they've done the due diligence to have the seatbelt on. What they've also seen is initially they had students, and you had students that came up not wearing seatbelts. So you know the old right. high school students when they first instituted it weren't wearing the seatbelts. But now that the kids have come up, they're now wearing them in the cars, now they're wearing them in the school right. bus, they're wearing them. Um, New York is interesting because New York requires them, but they leave it up to the school district to mandate whether the students are going to wear them or not. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so it's it's kind of okay. You put the money into it, but you're not going to you're not going to have the kids wear them. Good. Say if you had Wi-Fi on the bus, but it was only activated if your seatbelt. <laughs> so, your any recommendation that you would like to offer? Other than, uh, you don't you don't recommend that we do cameras or, or look at that or? I do recommend we look at cameras. I recommend we look at the look at the um, financial feasibility of the extra lighting. Um, particularly either what Ohio has or what um, Rutland Northeast is now using, um, as well as the, the striping for Ohio, that Ohio is using. Um, so and there's no the standard from a school bus company that manufactures buses that they have to follow that's generic across the country? There is the federal standard that is generic across the country. They must meet those which include okay. the the thin striping around the door but, but and the, the lighting windows. is optional if you want four lights versus two. No, nope, that is mandated by by feds too. But um, you're saying the, 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 the eight, 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 eight way eight light those system. Are the those are the, the the main lights, the amber and the red light system you see now consistently. That is mandated federally. The ex, auxiliary lights that Pat's talking like bumper or height or in the grill, those are I put a, optional. I put a bar light like you had, Jake. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? Nice but he said I love it. It came back to me. So the cameras do work, especially when you go through the toll booth and you don't pay your fine. They work. You send the, the bill gets sent right to your house. It doesn't make a difference who's driving it. They pay. So yeah, the toll right. booths work that way. So right. that I'm thinking the cameras would work the same way. It's the vehicle that actually went through that at that point, who cares who's driving it, the, the owner of the vehicle will find that out That can't happen on their bus rules or regulations? Right now it can't. We have to be able to identify the driver and issue the driver, huh. specifically. So I'd like to change that to send that to the owner of the vehicle. Yeah, yeah. it's strange that they, if you, they make toll booths or whatever they call them, they get it automatically. Get it all the time. And, and just one of the things is like the auxiliary lighting, the camera Easy system, hats. the seat belts. Um, the school district, they themselves, the ones that like contract, they can certainly specify that. Like I was talking about, Pat is the particularly like the seatbelt system. The school district can, if they're contracting, like first student or some of the other, well, uh, they, 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 they can say as part of the contract you have to. 
There is um, one school district or one school provider, and I'm trying to think of their name. They're up in the Lamoille County area. Lamoille Transportation, maybe? Oh, yeah, Lamoille Valley. I think it's them. Mm -hmm. Are now, every bus they purchase now comes with a three point system. Really? Wow. Um, I spoke to the Thomas dealer, um, Cressy Tom, the Cressy dealership. Um, I'm actually in communication with a lot of the dealers and manufacturers. Um, but they have told me that, yeah, that they are now ordering their buses with seatbelts. Mm -hmm. So, so um, they're the only ones I know in Vermont that are, are doing that. Um, I know that First Student and a lot of the buses we see come in from First Student and um, Student Transportation of America. Um, some of them are new, but some of them are coming from other states. So, um, and that. Can you run? How many kids get injured in school buses a year? Did you say that already? Um, not sure how many injured. We don't keep those stats, but on an average, we have nine children that are killed in the loading unloading time frame of um, nationally. 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 That includes not only passings, but that also includes accidental runovers by the by the school bus driver. Um, Does that happen in Vermont that we're aware of? The last one that happened in Vermont was the 2003-2004 school year. It was a child um, in Barrie that went to retrieve some papers um, under the under went, the bus, and the driver was out of sight. lost track and ran over. You know, it must be very difficult for a driver to see seriously. If you the hood is up here, and you got if the kid does fall, you try. Mm -hmm. You got to make sure that kid goes across. And field trip. trip, and that's so yeah. I thought field trip. You should drive the bus to see how it is. Yeah, it, it must be tough. It's gonna be tough. That's again one of the things we train is you have to count the kids. So if wow. you have five kids that are going going around going across, you should be counting five kids on the other side oh, before you do anything. Wow. Wow. It is. It's a huge Noise. responsibility for the driver. Do they have a camera in front of the bus? That's shows up inside their bus that no. they, they, they don't. Some states do, because we've seen, you know, Yeah, I think boy, that would be a mandatory. Mm -hmm. I, there is camera systems that they can have installed that will do everything, you know, every right. angle you want. In Vermont, we don't require them, so a lot of the districts, they might have interior cameras. Some districts might actually have exterior we are fortunate. red light cameras. Kids that transport every day, really. Well, it sounds like our bus, school bus system is safer than general transport. I mean, yeah. kids get run over by their parents probably more frequently than school buses, right. so the safety efforts probably is School bus transportation nationally is the safest in the U.S. Um, if you look at percentage-wise, 1% of the kids that are killed going to and from school are on a school bus. 50% are in a child's or another student's car. Sure. Um, and I think it's 40% are parents, and then the remaining is walking or bicycling. Mm. So. Well, when you're in a school bus, you're a hammer, not a nail. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's much safer because you're in that big. And the bus, is, the bus is specifically designed for, for safety, and I can go with yeah. uh, that. would take hours to talk about mm. what they do on buses to make them safe. So if we were to explore cameras, we just could recommend they explore them and not, I mean, I don't know what else. Is this do. required, are these additional things that Vermont has, are they in statute or are they in regulation? Additional. Lighting or whatever that, um, that's over and above what buses have because to meet the federal standards. So do we have additional ones in Vermont? And are, if so, are they in statute or are they in regulation or are they just in a, manual of recommendation. Right now it is not in statute. Rather than Northeast contacted us um, to see if it was legal to do it. Our research showed that because it's part of the eight way, they only come on when the eight ways come on. So our research was that if they're coming on with the eight ways and they're disabled once the eight ways are turned off, then it doesn't violate our red light permits, our, our color light law. Um, and that's why we allowed them to do it. Um, so I think in that case, if we were the, if the state was to mandate the extra lighting, um, it wouldn't take a legislative change, except for the mandate, mandating the, the lighting. But as far as changing our, our permit, our color light permit, um, I don't think we need to do that. So. 
Okay. Anything else? Thank you very much for the information. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Summer, I must have got to the phone calls of people. Oh. You know, people passing the buses all the time. Yeah, they're not running over a kid, but they're right. passing them, violating the law. And he's, he shows the, the numbers that are going through the red light. And, you know, you just try no, to. That's definitely. Yeah, right. how do you. Right. That's what he reported. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Sorry. And, but it was still lower than it was in the past. Like, yeah, it's yeah, it, it's improving. But when you hear these stories, <clears> there <throat> was one this summer in our area, went up on the sidewalk and, 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 you know, passed the bus right up on the sidewalk. I mean, you know what's I think an issue? So like when I'm driving behind a, so in Burlington, stu many students take the Greenmount Transit buses. That's the way they get to and from, oh, which do not have nothing. No, they don't have a uh, thing. And so I think what's happening, at least in some parts of the state, is people are, you know, it used to be you're behind a bus, you expected the little sign to come out, and that was your rule of thumb. Now it's actually in many places more often than not you can go around the bus. So I think people are losing. But that. those are not school buses. They're not school buses. They're used for school, but they're used as a. We're, we're looking at the orange and yeah. uh, with the, the lights and all the stuff. Official school buses. Yeah, they ride the buses in the city. Yeah. Yeah, they have no control over that. They, they, they just ride a regular bus, right? With, with other passengers. With other passengers. Can I ask why, um, that being new to this committee, why do buses still stop at railroad stations, at railroad tracks? Yeah, that's up to, yeah. I feel like it's more likely to get the kids killed. You know, you stop right on the track. On what the happens? Track. Wait, that don't stop on the no, track. Stop. No, they stop. Yeah. The driver is basically aligned with the track. The thing is, oh, and if a train's coming, what are they going to do? Probably try and the instinct is going to be to hit the gas and go forward, killing all the kids and leaving them at the front safely. I just always wonder, wow. but I've always wondered, what's the point? When's the last time a school bus got, I mean, I'm not making light of how many, when's the last time a school bus got hit by a train? Yeah, oh, how many oh, times has a school bus been waiting for a line by a car? Just a couple a weeks ago, there was one. Where? That, um, and the uh, train pushed it down the track. Yeah. In Vermont? No, it oh. wasn't in Vermont, no. But, but we, it's not just school buses that stop at your own track. Fuel trucks. Fuel, 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 fuel trucks. Fuel trucks. Fuel, fuel trucks. This, vehicle, this vehicle stops at all railroad crossings. Okay. And I believe commercial buses are supposed to stop oh, as well. I, I guess I think they do. So yeah. this, okay. is because, oh, right. this is Come because on, we yeah. this is because we don't have the gates at every. That's right. No way. Right. We should okay. upgrade all our railroad yeah. yeah, There we go. Okay. And the trains can go faster. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Look at that. Before the senator asks <laughs> another question, I can't answer. He's thinking. <laughs> no, no, I'm no. just thinking. We, uh, <laughs> you know, we've had. <laughs> We have relatively recent housing on our waterfront, so the last 25 years or so. When people move in, they don't like the sound of the train coming through at night. Remember that? The city council people were saying, can you tell them not to like whistle and do all the It's like, you know, the train was here before came. Yeah. I always say, who was there first? I like the train. Good But I'm uh, from the same. We had an issue outside of Burlington when I was on Ag, and it was on the... Is that Charlotte with the smell? No, this was uh, right on the other side of Barry here. We went to a little trip and it was uh, Hammer, Carl Hammer. Oh, uh, yeah, his compost. Oh, uh, the rats. His neighbor. Uh, yeah, I've never seen so many chickens and yeah. picking through stuff. That's unbelievable. Well, Senator Ash just got on his first vice chair of the joint rules. Oh, yeah. And his speaker is vice chair, so together they're going to. But I did about 1% of the talking. Correct. Yeah. Like, oh, was it joint rules this morning? Yeah. I'm glad you came in because it would have gone on for a long time. You know, there was a little bit of a monologue. Yeah. 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 Uh, Nick Sears was looking for his committee. <laughs> well, we, we took care of it. Yeah. Right. Okay, next one this morning is Thomas Vehicle Testing Language. Joe Segali, who's. Where is Joe Segali? Where is Joe? No, <laughs> he's coming. He's coming. All right. I can give you language in the intros. Okay, you want to join us this morning? Is this for the miscellaneous? 
I believe that is the plan. Miscellaneous. The MV bill. This is your right? Mm -hmm. I was gonna say that's pretty okay. good. This is mine. Yeah. Autonomous vehicles. I thought you were. Yeah, he emailed me. <laughs> Peter says that his car can come get him. <laughs> I believe it. Really? His car? Yeah. I don't know if it's how it does with like security gates, but I think it comes with badges to the to that side. It can. It, and it, it has the function even when you're in it where you don't have to do anything. It'll just take care of it. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I think what's fun is to see how it performs compared to you. And it's, but it's, it's like detecting the lines. I don't know how it does it. What I think something will just go up at your house right here. And you know, when you're 99, it could be pretty handy. <laughs> I thought I'd get a call from this one. Yeah, I went home, but, um, the, you know, the... Here, stay over. Yeah. yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Okay. Is that all the Do you know, I have to say, I've commuted since 1973, and I've never not made it. I've never stayed over huh? all the years I've been here. And I've never, never stayed over, but I've never had not made it home or made it to work. I mean, the worst thing that happens is that instead of 45 minutes, it takes an hour. Takes a half, and that's the... Yeah. Or the other night, two and a half. Yeah, well, that's you know. so got a business to live for you. Business so while you're sleeping, you have your car, like similar to Peter's car. Yeah. Go out and do it. Do it forever. Go to your parents. And then the car's there when you're ready to go to work. Yeah. You, you would have fewer, money you would have fewer you complaints from the riders than if I was driving um, myself. I would call them. So I like it. Yeah. And you just have your picture on the dashboard, so once they miss you, they can look at you. With some recorded messages. Right. So I would just call them. I have no music there, you have video, you can have it all. Uh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Would, you like to, would you like to join us and go over this, or how you want to? Oh, I no. think Joe is Okay, Joe is running. All right, okay. We want to take a five-minute break while we're waiting for Joe? Okay. okay. So we have joint fiscal, Tim, you're on joint fiscal? Yeah. Now. You're putting yourself on it. No, but I'm taking this a lot of myself. <laughs> oh, that's, the last, that's the last one standing. Anything with this, you want to do? my ass. From them. Oh, from the so that, Right, and then there's a postcard if you'd like to order some. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, they, they they'll deliver it for you for Valentine's Day. Oh, that's oh. oh. wait a minute, that's advertising now, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> they got you. Barnes and Noble, they know you. There you go. One year I got a bag of potting soil. I thought that was a good one. Okay. Yeah, all right, good morning. Good morning. Apologize. Is that all right? Being late. Uh, so, uh, here to talk about the um, proposed language from the DMV miscellaneous bill um, to allow for testing of automated vehicles on public roads. Oh, wow, that's a bill. Um, and so, what I wanted to do was just start to give you some background information on the different levels of vehicle automation because it's important to understand that concept as we get into the actual details of the bill. And so I handed this out. Um, on one side is sort of a kind of a simple overview of the different levels of automation, just for reference later on. Um, but I want to actually talk more about this table, this detailed table, because it can kind of help understand the basic concepts. Um, and this table is from the Society of Automotive Engineers, and it's kind of the reference <coughs> to the state. Um, legislation around the country is referring to when it starts talking about the different levels of automation. So just to go across the top, there's the different levels, one through one, uh, zero through five, there's six levels. Um, there's a description of it, um, and then the first column, DDT stands for um, the dynamic driving task. And so that is basically um, everything that an individual or an automated driving system needs to do to drive the vehicle. So to be able to identify and recognize events and objects to move the vehicle forward and backward, left and right, everything that we do to drive a car. Um, so uh, there's um, the OEDR, that's a really a tough one, but it's object and event detection and response. What that really is is just simply the ability to monitor the environment around the vehicle and then to be able to respond accordingly. Um, the DDT fallback, so the driving fallback, means what happens when the system fails 
who's, you know, is it the system itself that's going to take over control of the vehicle or is it a human driver? And that's a key differentiation between these different levels. And then ODD is the um, operational design domain. And what that means is where is the system um, allowed to operate? So it could be um, time of day, it could be weather, like when operate in the snow, um, it could be specific ge geographic areas, um, and so on. Um, so just starting with level zero, that's conventional vehicle. Um, it may have, <coughs> may have some automated features on it that you know we're becoming familiar with, like block blind spot or any lock brakes, which those are you know a certain level of automation. Um, but they're, they're sort of instantaneous and they're not sustained. And, in, that, and in, in this case, conventional vehicle, the driver is obviously responsible for driving the vehicle, is responsible for the fallback if anything goes wrong, and you know, the, the design domain is not really applicable in this case. So levels one through five is when we start getting into um, automation. And, um, and the key difference between levels one and five and level zero is that they're sustained, the automation is sustained in some way. Whereas level zero, it's kind of this instantaneous message and then it's done, one through five might be sustained. So an example, to start with one, is adaptive cruise control. And at level one, the automation um, only works in one direction, like it could be backwards, forward, or it could be maybe left or right, but it's generally um, just one direction. Um, and the, the driver is still responsible for monitoring what's happening around and is still responsible for everything that happens with the vehicle. If, if the system fails, like adaptive cruise control isn't working right, the driver is obviously responsible for that. And then it's the, the operational design domain is limited. Um, so if we go up to level two, partial driving um, automation, again it's sustained, but the vehicle, the automation allows the vehicle maybe to go left or right, forward or backwards. An example of that is parking assist. You know, you see where the vehicles will kind of turn and back in and park themselves, right? So it's not just going one direction. Um, and it, so in that case, while while the you know system is while that movement's going on, the automated driving system is in control of the vehicle. But it's but the driver or the human is still monitoring what's happening, um, and the driver still has to fall back. Meaning, if the system fails, the driver has to be able to take over the car. And it's very limited in terms of where the system happens. So that's um, zero, one, and two. And the legislation does not address those. And the reason why is because the driver in all those cases is still ultimately responsible. <clears throat> so if we move up to um, levels three, four, and five, this is when it, the system becomes more capable of driving the vehicle. So starting with level three, conditional driving uh, automation, um, so uh, the system is, can move the vehicle left, right, or forward. And a common example of this might be, if you've heard of Tesla's autopilot, which it can more or less drive the car for most of the time. Um, the system does monitor the environment around it, but to a limited degree. But, and this is the key aspect of level three, is that the human driver always has to be ready to take control. The human driver has to be receptive, sort of like the way you're receptive to a fire alarm. Like, you're not worried about a fire alarm right now, but if it happened, you know, you would react accordingly. Yeah. And then the design, uh, the operation design domain is limited to certain cases. So it might be, um, this technology is, can be used in stop and go traffic, you know, where you're staying in one lane. It can be used maybe where there's, where the lane markings are clear and, and the vehicle can read and interpret the lane markings. Um, so the next level up is um, high driving automation. And in this case, the um, the system is completely driving the vehicle. It's also completely monitoring the environment around the vehicle um, and responding accordingly. Um, and I have a question. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about ability to read the markings, um, in a snowstorm, the markings are covered. Right. Uh, what happens with an autonomous vehicle when? Yeah. Um, Does it work well? No, I'm, ju no, I'm just wondering to yeah, what extent environmental market. conditions will impact uh, on sort of the technology. So that's a great example of what I mean by I that. could have used it you know, <laughs> the other night because the markings um, are getting pretty faded and it's right. uh, really hard to see. But I just wondered if the road actually is covered. So that's an example of an operational design domain. So uh, like a level three vehicle, 
may, if, it, if it needs to be able to see the edge lines and it can't see the edge lines, then it, it can't be operating You're in those control. conditions. And then the driver has to take over control. You won't be able to see them either, but you, you, know, you can see other things and the driver reacts accordingly. At some point, they will link it with probably some kind of satellite imagery, right? Because where your vehicle is, is can be linked to something that has data about where the lanes are. Yeah, there's a little bit of debate about that because the vehicle itself should be able to, you know, especially when we get to level four or five, should be able to interpret the environment around it and act accordingly without having to hook into a satellite or traffic signals or anything else, just like you can as a human. And it'll be enhanced, its safety will be enhanced if it can connect in. And the other sort of distinction too with it, the, this dynamic driving task, is that it's not, it's tactical and operational, so it's how you move the vehicle in the traffic around you. Whereas it's not strategic, which is that's where sort of that mapping comes in, which is I want to go from National Life down to the Capitol. You know, and that's a strategic decision. And then I call up the self-driving car and it comes gets me and knows how to get me down here. So the mapping is, you know, I think the, the, the thinking is that if we have to just rely on mapping, it'll never be as ubiquitous as it needs to be because it's not as precise. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so level four is um, the system is driving it, the system is interpreting the environment around the vehicle and responding. And um, the system, and this is the key difference between a level four and a level three. In this case, the system has the ability to put the vehicle in what's called a minimal risk condition if the system itself fails. So, whereas level three, it's the human that takes over the vehicle, level four, if the system fails, it's, there's backup system that um, might pull the car over to the side of the road. It might put it in something called lip home mode, you know, which just gets over, goes slow, and the flashes are on, and it gets it back to wherever it's stationed. So it's the system, not the human. And it's still, the operational design domain is still gonna be limited. Like it could be an on-campus shuttle, for example, or it could be it's only running up and down State Street um, or at certain times of the day. But the, but the automated driving system is still in control of the vehicle. Now, four is a little bit different in that there could be a situation where a human would take over, but the human doesn't need to take over. And then when we get to level five, that's just complete automation. And the human, if a human is on board, they're only a passenger. The vehicle is doing everything. Um, and that's the simplest to understand, but I mean, and what makes this so complicated is that we're going to be going through this evolution of these different types of automation. And there's going to be a mix of these vehicle types on the road. So I'll stop there. Is there any questions that, before I kind of start, assume we want to start walking through the bill itself? Well, so we're, we're, the bill is anticipating the development of this technology and how many states have actually, before we get into it, is this modeled after um, legislation that other, another yes. state may have passed? Or? There's a bunch of states, eight, nine, ten states that have testing legislation. Uh -huh. There's the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators and the DMV's kind of national umbrella organization that has developed guidance on it. Some states, you know, like California, for example, because uh, Google, Google's out in California and they have a company that's developing a car called Waymo. No, I know. And they got way out of front in legislation. And so if you look at their early drafts, you know, and then they modified and modified and modified. And so there's a lot to learn from California and Texas. Why would any manufacturer want to test here? Um, well, because <clears throat> we'll probably have to encourage them to test here. But because we have a unique environment, right? We're a rural environment. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a lot of rural miles. And we have we have seasons and mountains. We have gravel dirt roads, 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 gravel roads. Yeah, uh, mud season. But I don't think they're going to be knocking down our door to come here. And I mean, I sort of see this as allowing the testing of automated vehicles on public roads, which is a little. It's not clear in statutes whether that's permitted or not. And I think that the agency of transportation is probably going to have to take the lead just like Rhode Island is doing now to invite, you know, and maybe even fund some of the testing in our state so that we can, we want Vermonters to be exposed to the technology so they can learn and become com comfortable with it. That's the prime reason for, for kind of encouraging testing. 
And the vehicles that have been developed so far, how are they propelled? Are they electric? Um, for the most part, they're they're electric. And this gets to like a bigger policy issue too. The thought is that you know this is another way for us to start encouraging more adoption of electric vehicles, and it'll still take a little bit of time. But it, this technology just works better on an electric vehicle than on a you know gas powered vehicle. Well, I think it's very forward looking, and it aligns with the demographics. We're all getting old, so see, um, um, this is going to help us. Right. So maintain mobility. So you're saying we... we're going to disallow people above a certain age to get licenses, <laughs> and this is the trade-off. Or you may you never have a license. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. what I mean. Because... It just—it really, when you think about mobility as your as your age, it's a major concern and independence and right. whatever. Yeah. So. Huh? So, we were Look looking at that. You're going to have to have a name for the autonomous vehicle. Oh my God. <laughs> Joey is the best. He picks me up right at the front. I know. He you never don't have to, complains. You don't have to tip huh? names. Yeah, you don't have to tip. So You're right. I, I haven't really tried to give you the whole spiel about why this is good, but I mean, you know, one of the prime reasons is safety. That's why the transportation industry is so interested in it. You know, because driver error is yeah. a major source of. Exactly. But then also the mobility and accessibility benefits that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then I think for Vermont, we don't want to be behind in the technology, right? We want to make sure that as it starts to roll out that we're a place that, you know, it works. Well, we, I agree. We've got to be forward looking, not right. just old and unaffordable. Right. <laughs> right. So uh, would you like me to start walking through this? Sure. And um, thanks for Anthea for we had a rough draft, and you know, they did their magic on it. So um, this will be this, as I mentioned, will be part of the miscellaneous, the MP miscellaneous bill, and it'll be added into Chapter 41 of Title 23, and it's the Automated Vehicle Testing Act. Um, so uh, through the, I can start with the definition. So automated driving system is the hardware software that are capable of performing the entire dynamic driving task. There's that term again, it's gonna come up a lot. So the, which is driving the car uh, on a sustained basis and it, it's related to levels three, four, and five. So again, this legislation is about testing for levels three, four, and five because that's really where the most risk is, right? Because the vehicle is taking over control. <clears throat> um, automated vehicle um, is, any, is defined as a vehicle with um, automated driving system level three, four, five, for the reasons I just described. Um, automated vehicle tester or tester means an individual company, public agency, or other organization that's testing an automated vehicle on public highways. That could be VTRANS, that could be Department of Motor Vehicles, that could be the University of Vermont, or it could be a company that wants to come here and test. And like I said, more than likely, we're gonna end up being a partner with whoever wants to come here and test. <coughs> Moving on to the next page. <clears throat> the dynamic driving task, I already described that. Highly automated vehicle um, is level four or five, and that's because the system is always in control and the system is responsible for the fallback. So if, it, if there's a failure of the system, the vehicle can pull over. Uh, manufacturer is pretty broad. It could be the individual or company that designs, produces, or constructs vehicle or equipment. Could be a manufacturer that included the original um, equipment manufacturer um, at different stages of, of the vehicle. Um, so if, if um, there's a car that's on the market right now, and let's just say there's a Vermont company that's interested in automated vehicles, and they buy that vehicle, and they put some sort of automated driving system on, they are then you know, essentially responsible for that vehicle. Um, minimal risk condition is, as I described earlier, which is the ability to fall back and to either to keep driving in a safe way or to just pull over and stop the vehicle. Operational design domain on page three is when, where the vehicle, the automated driving system can actually be engaged and used, and it could be environmental conditions, roadway types, specific locations. <clears throat> Public highway is as defined in that statute. We may want to take another look at that. Um, uh, John Dunleavy did look at it, but I just want to verify that's the right reference um, because I think there's one definition of public highway. Like police officers, I think, can pull over um, 
you know, people that they're concerned about, even when they're not on a public highway. And so just want to double check that and make sure that's the right definition. SAE J306, it's the Society of Automotive Engineers, and it's their you know, practice, that's, that's this document um, that's being used throughout, and it's where I pulled this table from here that defines what the different levels of automation are. If you're really interested in getting into the weeds on this, <laughs> let me know, I'll get you a copy. Um, test vehicle operator is the person that's actually in the vehicle and is, um, under certain cases, is the fallback. Um, so on number 10, we're making reference to a specific do date of that document. If it gets updated, you're going to have to go in and update the statute? Um, mm -hmm. The way it's written. Any subsequent versions. Yeah, or, so that's yeah, right. or the most current. Well, it says and any subsequent versions, so. Oh, or any, okay, any subsequent versions. Mine's not in I guess that takes care of it. Okay. Any questions on the definitions? So moving on to section 4203, um, paragraph A. So I do have one question. Yes. Um, just wondering as we get move through the meat of the um, bill, is this only if I if I lived on a private road? Um, this isn't intended to allow the testing on private roads. Is that right? I'm just looking at the, the definition only includes state or municipal highways. So right. I'm just. It, yeah. So if, um, the long dirt road, you know. You don't have regulatory authority over that road. If someone were to say, does that mean someone's going to be able to, you know, people from space are going to come and test on my road? The answer would be not under this construct. Not unless they let them do it. Right. And, you know, there's situations around the country where vehicles are being on, uh, evaluated on test tracks, you know, privately on test tracks. Thunder Road, I don't know. I mean, if they right. want That's to That's a private contract, yeah. basically, or a green. Yeah. But this is speaking specifically to use on public right. road roads. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so moving on, page three to um, paragraph A. So the idea is that the traffic committee would essentially have, is, have the authority to issue a permit to allow for the testing of automated vehicles. Can you refresh our memory of who's on the traffic committee? It's the Secretary of Transportation, the Commissioner of uh, DMV, and the Commissioner of Public Safety. And the, you know, they generally, like one of the most common things they do now is um, modify speed limits. They have a few other statutory things that they're responsible for. And you know, they operate, they have to follow the public notice, you know, um, requirements. And the idea is that they, and they're staffed, um, at VTrans, they're staffed by our traffic, uh, traffic, traffic system and management operations unit, you know, which takes care of the traffic signals and does the signs and the lines and that sort of stuff. And, um, and so the thought is that they would be part of the staff reviewing the application as well as others. Like I imagine I would be involved to some extent. And, um, and they would make, the staff would make a recommendation to the traffic committee on, you know, any conditions, any permit conditions and so on. Um, and I'm going to talk just generally about that process, maybe rather than going through each paragraph, but um, so, you know, we, the, the, bill, the bill allows the agency of transportation to develop guidelines for the application. And at one point, I was listing all the details that would go into that application and the legislation, and I just thought it was just too extensive, you know, like name and, and so on. And um, but there's good there's uh, examples of practices around the country that we can use to follow that, and then it gives us a little bit of flexibility as things change over time. Um, one of the questions uh, when we initially had a group of stakeholders together, including BLCT and others, and um, you know, what's the role of the municipalities in approving the use of uh, testing of automated vehicles? Because obviously, you know, most of the roads in the state are local roads under uh, municipal jurisdiction. And so this requires that the tester contact the municipality and essentially ask them to write a letter and identify, you know, any, they have to 
coordinate, collaborate with the municipalities. It doesn't give the municipalities veto over this. And so that's, you know, that's a policy question that certainly could be debated. Um, but the thought is that, you know, just, just in the way that we issue licenses for drivers, right, that, you know, drivers can drive anywhere on the state highways. And municipalities could certainly make their concerns known um, at, at the public hearing. And, um, you know, you have to have faith that the, that the appointed officials that are on that committee are going to listen and, and respond. To um, so that's kind of just, a, that's, that's really in a nutshell when it comes to what the traffic committee is going to do. Um, is it helpful, helpful for me to go through each of these paragraphs with you, or? <laughs> I have some questions, but you know, I think that's just me. Yeah. As I'm reading through about okay. those who would seek a permit from this traffic committee, you have to be 25 years or older to be one of the testers. So that's so there's the okay there's the tester, which is you know the manufacturer or the entity that owns the vehicle, um, and then there's the that what you're referring to is the operator. The operator of the right. test vehicle. Yeah. yeah. So let me walk through this then just to make sure, and maybe questions will get answered. So paragraph A, as I mentioned, the traffic, <coughs> traffic committee has got the authority to issue the permit. Um, paragraph B is that they'll conduct a hearing to provide for comments from the public. Um, C is that anybody aggrieved by the decision of traffic committee may appeal to the superior court. Um, D is that the automated vehicle tester, so that's not the person necessarily the person in the vehicle, but the person that owns the vehicle. Um, shall make um, the, the test permit available to law enforcement and municipalities within their operational design domain, so where the test is going to be happening. Um, and then following completion of their test, they'll submit a report to the traffic committee summarizing results, observations, safety, traffic operations, et cetera, everything they've learned, essentially. So moving on to paragraph F. And so, this is a, another um, key decision point. So an automated vehicle tester shall not test an automated vehicle on a public highway unless the vehicle operator is A, seated in the driver's seat, B, monitoring the operation of the vehicle, and C, capable of taking immediate control. Um, so uh, that seems really, really reasonable, right? Like you want a human being in the car. Um, but I'm just gonna jump you ahead to paragraph G on page six, bottom of page six. And so what this says is, notwithstanding subsection F of this section, a highly automated vehicle, which is level four or five, which means the vehicle has the ability to get into a minimal risk condition, may be tested on a public highway without, essentially without a human being inside the vehicle, as long as um, the manufacturer um, has the ability to control the vehicle. So that could be remotely. Essentially it's saying they can control the vehicle remotely and the vehicle, I think we say or, but I think it probably should be and, um, has, the, has the technical ability to get into a minimal risk condition. So the question about whether or not we should require a human being in the test vehicle is a, is a key point. And I looked at, um, the test, I looked at legislation around testing from different states, and <laughs> so Florida, California, Colorado, Nevada, they all allow testing without human being in the vehicle, you know, under the same conditions. You still have to be able to control the vehicle remotely and it has to be able to get into the minimal risk condition. Other states don't have language specifically around testing, but they allow um, the automated vehicles to operate on their highways without, without a human being in the vehicle. And that includes Georgia, Nebraska, North Carolina, Tennessee, Texas. There are other states that, are, that explicitly require a human being in the car at all times. So Connecticut is one of them. Connecticut just had legislation passed recently. Massachusetts doesn't have legislation, but uh, the governor issued an executive order, and in that executive order, requires a human being be in the car at all times. 
Um, New York requires a person to be present in the vehicle. Washington, D.C. also requires a person to be in the vehicle. Um, and so the reason, and so the, the um, Association of Motor Vehicles Administrations, they, they recommend that legislation account for a situation where a, a, a human doesn't need to be in a car. So, um, so that's what you would recommend yeah. is in this language? Yes. Okay. And is there still only been one fatality? Oh no, there's been there's been more than one. Um, and you know, there was sort of one of the early ones was Tesla a few years ago, which was probably like a level two type of car. Arizona or I can't remember the state, but yeah. you know, that it was that was sort of a famous one. I think it was. No, 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 I mean, uh, not of the accidents, but like in Arizona, there an autonomous vehicle killed a pedestrian. Right. You know, so that's the kind of accident, I guess, I was thinking of where there was nobody in the vehicle. And the no, there was a person in the vehicle. Was, okay. Yeah. But the person didn't manage to. Yeah, you know, if, I still haven't seen the final analysis of that, but, you know, there's a video you can watch of the, of the driver inside the vehicle, and he, you know, he's just looked away. Um, and, and then it was dark. She was pushing a bike across the divided highway with a median. And that, and that, you know, and I don't know really, I mean, the laws of physics still apply, right? <laughs> even, even if the vehicle has the ability to detect something. We should put something. that in the <laughs> well, The law of physics still applies. It's not yeah. an intense section, it's a <laughs> nah. statement of acceptance of basic laws. It would be a finding. In the finding. I mean, that is the risk, right? I mean, that's, that, that's like the big challenge here is like, ultimately we want the technology to remove the human from the decision-making process because humans make most of the decisions, but it's still not going to be perfect. Um, and, and we have to somehow shepherd that in, you know, in a, as safe a way as possible. So, so the traffic committee has the ability to put conditions on the permit. And so if there was a tester that came and said, well, we, we do want to test vehicles without a driver on board, um, you know, the, the traffic committee can, you know, request whatever is necessary to make sure that's going to be done in a safe way and monitored in a safe way. Um, you know, a key part of that is that the vehicle has already been tested in off-road conditions in situations that, you know, are similar to what they would find uh, actually on a public highway. So, if the city of Burlington said they wanted to test it in a more urban as opposed mm -hmm. to rural, they could take position, but they they couldn't override the traffic committee's decision. Is that, if I understood what you were saying? So if the city of Burlington wanted to lead the test themselves, is that no, what you're No, say if they wanted to say no. Um, right. I just wanted to go back to what you're saying is, if the traffic committee said yes, the municipality doesn't have the authority to say no. That's right. That's as it's currently. Time. And if the city of Burlington, I'm you know, using the examples you gave of those who said you could have a driverless vehicle versus um, one that required passenger, it seems congested areas were the ones that mm -hmm. put an emphasis on having a person yeah. there. Um, so if Burlington, if this passed with the language allowing for an unpersoned <coughs> vehicle, and Burlington said, well, we only want the monk or Robin or Montpelier only want <coughs> the vehicle. The way it's written, that they could not uh, impose those conditions on the test. Well, we could. Pro the city, the city could not. The city could request that the traffic committee through the public hearing. Yeah, you know, or through letter and and all the other ways that we're pressured <laughs> to you know to respond. Uh, yes, so that that is the way it's presented. Okay, so I'm going to back up to F. I think that's what I was right. Six? Yes, I'm back on page four. So I actually, so again, you know, in, most, in, in case, certain cases, there's going to be somebody, a, a, a human being will be in the vehicle, and they need to be seated and be able to take over control. So if we go over to page five, that person that's in the vehicle needs to be an employee, contractor, other person designated and trained by the um, automated vehicle tester concerning the capabilities and limitation of such automated vehicle. In our application, we, you know, we require that they demonstrate that, provide information to back that up. Um, this is uh, 
Um, paragraph E is something that, so I had a group work with me, DMV people and public safety people as we were, as we were drafting this in. So they recommended that the person that's operating the vehicle be at least 25 years of age or older. And that's not something that's like any other state led legislation that I saw, but it seems to make sense, right? I don't think you can rent a car if you're once you're 25 years old. That's right. But you can be an auto mechanic at yes. 22, fixing people's car and letting them go on the road. So what's the difference between an auto mechanic and a person who's paid by a fancy company to test an autonomous vehicle? Well, I mean, they're not in the car driving the car, I guess. Um, that's the only difference. I mean, when they're working in the car, it's not moving. And, you know, there might be, I, it, it, it probably starts to be a question judge. You know, you're hiring company. an engineer to be in the car and manipulate things and be there to observe. It just seems that it's a self-selecting, they're not, you know, they're not the guy holding the mattress sale sign on the corner no. of a busy intersection. It's someone who graduated from B3C and was the one there might be, I don't hired by Tesla to like be in the car and observe things and monitor what I just it just seems that the age limit is strange. because um, they're already meeting these other yeah. tests. So anyways, I know that that's probably not the most important piece of this for me. For I don't think point. it's a you'll break the one way or the other. Got it. <laughs> Maybe I need to go back and reread it. It says an employee. An employee of what? It says an employee independent or a person's uh, and trained by a tester. So, um, uh, who, um, who is the employee? Is it I referencing that. some other prior definition? I would read, no, I, I, maybe that needs some more specific but it's the employee of the automated vehicle tester, or it's an independent contractor working under contract to the automated vehicle tester. All right, so you have two different things. You have the manufacturer, and then you have the testers that are separate entities. There's the tester, then there's the operator. Right? This D is under, is the tester of the vehicle is. That's one of the things that that person is an employee. No, the operator. I mean, yeah. 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 I think the sentence just needs to be rewritten because it's and, and it's also not clear who an other person would be that ought to be in the you know allowed to be in the car that isn't an employee or a contractor. Right. Do you have a sense of who that was meant to include? Of other. You could just say person designated. Yeah, I, that's a really good, I, I don't know, it's a good question. It might be it's not an employee or a contractor. I'm not sure we so want to be there. The street and throw the car. <laughs> I'm not sure we want to be there otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the owner of the company. They're not under any obligation, right? So maybe we. Yeah. Just senators. Just right. danger. Danger. Well, Senator Doyle tested a car, remember, at uh, oh, right. the car dealership? Oh, yeah. ran over. Oh, and he ran it. Yeah. He hit like 20 cars. <laughs> <laughs> This was, what, 10 years ago? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. What was he testing? Just starting a car. Super and He drove it out a lot, but it just, it was like a... <laughs> a bumper car. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, derby. Okay. So we'll, I guess I can work with the uh, language on that. I would just, I would ask them whether you care if you just jettison this other person language um, and what the real basis of the 25-year I think you probably can link it to the definition of test vehicle operator, who's the person who was in the vehicle on behalf of the automated vehicle tester. And maybe we need to change the language so there's more of a distinction between the tester and the test operator, because then you're confusing test a lot. Yeah. But, if you, but if you're, that's true. It, 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 the language is a little maybe just too close for yeah. the clear distinction. But on D, on top of five, it's still not clear who other than an employee or an independent contractor should be the operator. Right. So it, it might just be the simple thing rather than reworking it. It's just leaving out the other person. But unless there's some group that the model legislation envisions. I think you could just piggyback off of who they're already defining as a test vehicle operator who is an individual employed by or otherwise affiliated with the automated, yeah. okay. the automated vehicle tester who has successfully completed the tester safety driver training program. Yeah, and that's the definition. And yeah. So that's the definition of a person who's in the vehicle. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, 
otherwise affiliated is an unusual construct, but I mean, contracted. Or otherwise affiliated. I think that's trying to capture independent contractors or if they're. Oh, I, I, it might make, yeah, I think it might make sense on the definition to say something like an individual employed by or, uh, or contracted by. Then you're focusing on people who have a formal relationship, relationship. with, have been through yeah. the training, have been certified yeah. as someone yeah. who can drive for this company, or not drive, sit for this company. Or drive as needed. If things go south. So, um, are autom automated vehicle testers affiliated with them? So, are these? Um, clearly identifiable entities, or are they generally employees of the manufacturers of these vehicles? Uh, you know, I'm just. It's defined on uh, page, page one. Well, page three. I got to go back to page one. No, you used the wrong term. You, you, the tester and the operator are different, but yeah. confusing. Means an individual. The tester is a company, company that's applying agency. for the permit, basically. Yeah. Right. Right. The operator is the one who's actually yeah. going to be in the car. Yeah. What state are we modeling this from? Oh, I took it from a lot of different states. You just try to synthesize it into mm -hmm. this. So. Um, okay, so now we're talking about the, autom the automated vehicle tester. That's line seven, line six, paragraph two. Um, so the automated vehicle tester must register each vehicle. Um, with the commissioner of DMV pursuant to requirements of the vehicles here. Um, this next one, um, D requires uh, $5 million of insurance. So that's common in all the legislation that I looked at. When, you know, so now we're, this isn't you know, a normal situation. You know, this is testing vehicle, so um, it's reasonable to have a higher level of insurance. Um, this next one is um, that the autom automated vehicle tester has established and enforces a zero tolerance policy for drug and alcohol use by test vehicle operators while engaged in automated vehicle testing. Um, the policy shall include provisions for investigations of alleged policy violations and the suspension of drivers under investigation. And why, why yeah, I, restate what is already illegal? Um, I, I, you know, I may have to have like Jake or somebody come in and kind of provide the backup on that one. I mean, I think overall, there, the, the, the concept is that again, this is testing a vehicle on a public road. It's like a commercial vehicle, and they should probably have a higher standard than just a normal person operating a vehicle on a highway. It just seems strange. It's already illegal to do these things. So, um, is it necessary? To, is it necessary? And well, what, what would be the implications moving forward for others who are, uh, you know, do we, for if you have a license to a, a commercial? Well, here's a question: If we have, a, if you have a commercial trucking license, are you required to have policies that establish and enforce a zero tolerance policy for drug and alcohol abuse? Yeah. I think the federal CDL requires that the employer and, you know, has a policy that's... Yeah, I think so. Uh, I um, but there's a difference between... I mean, you were talking about what would be required normally. Well, we don't have a zero tolerance standard. It is illegal to drink alcohol or uh, do drugs while driving, while engaged in automobile and driving. So that's what I mean. Oh. It's already a, a, illegal these actions. So well, are they driving? They are, um, well, it's illegal to have alcohol, whether you're a passenger or a driver, because of changes that predated my time in the Senate, eliminating a long-standing Vermont tradition. And it is most certainly illegal to um, do drugs while driving. So you're but interpreting... Are they driving? Or being a passenger in a vehicle, subject to the motor vehicle laws. 
So you're it's already, already <laughs> <talking about it. laughs> So you can have your drink before you go in and test. Well, because only it says if it gets you to point two or less. Right. Yeah. Only if it gets you to point two right. or less. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, Which is the same standard for everything. No. It's point oh eight. That's point oh eight. Point oh two, I believe, came from the school bus operator standard. Oh. I can't answer your question about this one. Okay. So maybe. That's fair. I, I have a, a little bit of guidance here, and I haven't done a full comparison, but it looks like a lot of this language has been drawn from the language that was added to Title 23 last year on the TNC operators having the zero. Which, what does that mean? The transportation network companies for Uber and Lyft. Okay. So you'll see in the next paragraph they're talking about um, doing background checks pursuant to Section 751. That's a new language that was added in, so you're putting the onus on. Uber and Lyft to do background checks that the state then can do like an audit of. Mm -hmm. But I think that language also requires that the companies, the transportation network companies, have an enforced zero tolerance. So policy. there, I mean, the Uber Lyft issue was that first there, there were people who were drunk while picking up client, you know, paying customers. And they also found in Massachusetts that when they did a uh, review to determine whether people were uh, like convicted felons and stuff that a huge number of people were not allowed to be uh, paid for vehicles for hire. So I'm guessing that's why we did it for the, the, the Uber Lyft regulations. So the Uber Lyft regulations are mimicked very closely off of what the city of Burlington does in its vehicle for hire ordinance, which is very similar to what other states are doing. Mm -hmm. So they do the background checks, but then the state, I believe it's two times a year, and then on an as needed basis, if they have reason to think that they need to check them, can look at up to 25 driver record background checks. And when I was with the city of Burlington, I participated in these audits. But that is also a requirement in the city of Burlington to have the zero tolerance policy. So I think that's where the language is being drawn from. We're treating, in this proposed language, the testers, the manufacturers, more like Ubers <coughs> and Lyfts in that they're taking responsibility for who they're letting being, let be the test vehicle operators. Yeah. Well, it's not necessarily rational, but there's an explanation for it. It's different if I'm picking up Jim because he wants me to give him a ride to the airport. You don't want me to be someone who has been convicted of 15 serious felonies of an assault on a person or um, habitually drunk while during the work hours when I'm you know, on the shift. But a, a, but a vehicle being tested doesn't seem to be the same kind of activity that you know what I mean? It's very different in that there isn't a passenger in the vehicle, and that's why you have a lot of the restrictions on who can drive vehicles for hire, is you don't want someone who has a history of selling narcotics to then have the opportunity to be in a confined space with someone who's a vulnerable person. Or a sex be. offender. Exactly. Okay. Interesting. Uh, all right, so we can move on to the next page then. Um, so paragraph E is, we've touched on this already, which is so that automated vehicle tester has to certify that the legislative bodies of the municipalities where the test is occurring. Um, I certify that the legislative bodies of the municipalities where the automated vehicle will be tested have been notified when the operational design domain is on their limbs and that the proposed testing has been coordinated with those municipalities. This is all in section. I know this is all section F that we're in. Yes. Yes. <coughs> so this is the tester, as they're preparing their application, needs to contact the municipality, basically. So this, there seems to be an inconsistency that would need to get worked out here. So on the one hand, the municipality can't stop testing that's been authorized by the traffic committee. On the other, in number three, it's saying the operator and automated vehicle tester shall comply with any provision, any provision of state and local traffic laws. 
what if the local traffic law prohibits the use of unmanned yeah. vehicles? So there'd have to be some language which, if, this, if we were to actually go with the state preemption of local allowances, we would probably need to finesse that. Yeah, you know, the language, so in, in um, legislation that allows for the use of automated vehicles by the general public, not on earth, not testing, it's pretty common that there's language that says, you know, local jurisdictions cannot prohibit the use of automated vehicles. And at the federal level, it's kind of going that way with us. Too. Well, we don't have a Vermont law around that. No, we don't. So, and I don't, you know, I guess I have, I have some language we could throw in there that would be that specific. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not picking on you, but this will yeah. be a fast become a DLCT issue yep. um, mm -hmm. if we're preempting the ability of a community to say no. They want to, I think, I don't know, some of them might not care, but others will. Right. We've got to almost stop this one. we got people waiting on the other one. Uh, how much the the you the cost yeah, we got. Unless you got much more. Uh, 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 discussion, so. We've got two more pages here. Can we go through the last two pages quickly, or do you have anything to see this going to stand out? Please stop asking questions. Brad, <laughs> <laughs> right, you could come back and we could have more detail. Yeah, I okay. think all right. Yeah, okay. I think it'd be worthwhile to go into this a little more detail. Okay. All right. Apologize for being late. Okay. Good. Thank you. Flag for when you come back. What it means to clearly identify on the last page. You don't have to talk about it now, but yes. just what that means. Okay, we're going to move ahead. I envision that it's not like student driver, but it's going to say, don't be alarmed when it looks like the person's. You know, There's no one in it. The person dropped dead is lying on the floor of the vehicle. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, you want to grab Tom O'Leary? Is he outside here? Tom and uh, Mike Jones was here a minute ago, so. Hi, Michelle. You want to lead off, or you want those folks to lead off? Um, what I will do is. Yeah, Why are pages handing out buttons? And I can. Uh, 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 great uh, intro. This is inside. Either they have the wrong bill. I think it's, it's someone who says they're against S54, which I think is a rock bill. No, it's not. It's S57. But look, it's like a marijuana leader. Yeah, Tom, why don't you sit here and then um, so sure, Mike and just, there. yeah, I think we'll it's switch off. I'm just going to uh, open up. It's a home grower. He's the most important. I am, right. Or the pot part. I love pot. You should put that on your own pot. <laughs> you don't get Mike Shirley in here very often. Wow. Well, we can give it to AC. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not invited very often. Yeah, I I'll know. come at your best. Boarder. He's a boater, so we don't have to put laws on boats here. So we get to go. We're going to talk about airplanes today. Yes, that's more fun. Well, Mike has a boat that covers half the day, so it's, it gets bigger every time we chat. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not abandoned. No, that's right. It's not abandoned. Okay, Michelle, go right ahead. So uh, last year, the House Economic Development Committee asked us to delve more deeply into um, how we could better leverage our state airport systems for uh, aviation economic development purposes, including looking at um, energy systems which um, might be enhanced in terms of energy generation on state airports or may deliver services to folks that are going to be sited at state airports. And we were in the process of undertaking our aviation systems plan update, which is a statewide um, aviation plan that gets updated on a, about a five to 10 year basis um, as our re uh, part of our requirements with the Federal Aviation Administration. So we coupled this request of house economic development with our aviation systems plan update. And Secretary Shirley, myself, Dan DeLabre, who's here from our uh, Aviation and Rail Bureau, went out to all the communities that host state airports, um, with the exception of Island Pond, uh, and um, we, um, we held public meetings and invited a broad array of stakeholders to um, weigh in on um, this topic and ideas they had, et cetera. And so we delivered a report to the legislature in January that outlines a lot of the findings from that. One of the big um, sector areas that we have identified uh, in our 
work uh, since last year with Beta Technologies, and Tom O'Leary is here to speak to you about uh, their uh, framework, is um, this area of uh, electrified aviation and how this is going to be a transformative element of our um, aviation um, delivery system going forward into the future. And um, I don't want to, we have like some ideas about how we can support and advance um, the, the framework for not only electrified aviation, but other sectors of aviation using the state airports as leverage. Chris Kerrigan is also here with the Vermont Chamber and he's a key partner in all of this as well. But I think it would be helpful to sort of open this with hearing from Tom to talk about this new sector and then we can um, step back into some ways that um, we can support the sector and uh, other, <coughs> other frameworks going forward. So I'm going to cede the chair to Tom or oh, yeah, sure. we'll just switch places. Great, great. Okay. Wonderful. Um, thanks for having me in to, to speak. Uh, really just here to help you be aware uh, or help in any way I can. Um, and so maybe just a, a brief overview and then if you have questions about, about what we're doing and what it, and what it could mean and, and what the overlap is with, with state uh, business, that would be great. Um, so I'm, I'm the uh, COO of a company called Beta Technologies. We operate out of South Burlington on, on the Burlington uh, International Airport grounds. Uh, the company's been uh, in business for, for just two years, uh, and in that time, we have uh, conceived of, designed, developed, and flown our first electric aircraft. Uh, it's the largest electric aircraft in the world by weight, as far as, as, far as we know, um, are publicly released. And we've also designed and developed a prototype system for recharging uh, this aircraft and, and aircraft in the future. Um, the, the electric aviation space is one that's uh, widely considered to be inevitable. Um, I, and I say widely in terms of the, the industry itself in aviation. Uh, so, so we are aware the industry is tracking uh, well over a hundred companies that are engaged in, in one form or another of electric Aviation built essentially building a, a prototype um, as a means to certification and production of is that worldwide or nationwide worldwide yeah and uh, one group in particular that that uh, that that we follow uh, closely um, or, or we work with closely uh, we we've become uh, you know sort of a part of this this industry. They're tracking, they, they basically say, of these, there are 16 companies um, that, that, have our, that, are, that are to watch. They're on the watch list, essentially, you know, in a positive way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we're one of those companies. Um, and those companies include Boeing, Airbus, Embraer, uh, Bell, uh, the, the, the mainstays of, of you know, what, what you would call traditional uh, aviation, aerospace uh, companies, Sikorsky. I mean, th these are all the, all of the major players currently in aviation or in this space. In addition to those, there are other companies uh, that are, uh, you know, out of Germany and Silicon Valley uh, that are uh, founded, for example, by by the by, by Larry Page, the founder of Google. That are uh, startups that have been in business for for nine years, uh, and and are funded to the tune of a uh, hundred plus million dollars. There there are three companies that I can think of offhand. So it's a very um, it's very well established that the major players in aviation are going in this direction. Um, that's further validated by the fact that uh, the, the the centers for emerging technology like Silicon. Silicon Valley and Germany are investing heavily in these spaces. Uh, emerging markets uh, like Singapore and Dubai are 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 paying to, to bring this technology in. So it's a it's a global it's a global phenomenon, and we here out of of, uh, of Burlington Beta Technologies it has been because we have taken the path 
um, not of putting out an aircraft and saying, this is the future, a very sort of Jetsonian uh, sort of a view of things. Um, our founder, uh, Kyle Clark, and, and early employees basically were focusing on the core enabling technologies of propulsion and, and bringing an aircraft to uh, basically to fly. That was, that was essentially the thing. It was, it was um, a, a, I, I think, a very quintessentially Vermont thing. It was sort of like if you want to get something done, start doing it, right? You know, if you want to, as opposed to just drawing the pretty pictures. Uh, and so that's what we've done, and it's, and it's provided a great platform. And then, you know, unique to, to, to what we're bringing to the table is uh, Kyle was the former director of engineering at Dynapower. Um, he's, a, he's an expert in, in power electronics. Um, and so in addition to developing the aircraft technology, uh, we've also developed the recharging technology. Um, and, that, and that prototype, you know, it's essential, right? You need, you need this, right? I'm a former employee of Tesla. I was there uh, in, the, in the early days, and this was something that the, the, has really differentiated and enabled Tesla to create a viable business model today, right? Is that, that ability to overcome that objection of, okay, great, but where are you gonna charge it? And of course, you know, we, all, we, we know, even, even here in Vermont, in, in a, in a you know, somewhat rural state by comparison, uh, we have, I think, a half a dozen Tesla uh, supercharging uh, stations. At least that I visited. Uh, but anyway, so so that's a that's a really important aspect of this. Um, so we want to be on the on the cutting edge of this. We think it's we're proud to be doing this in Vermont, uh, and I'm and I'm happy to uh, to to answer any questions that you have. Help help uh, understand how this how this uh, this industry is emerging and how this is becoming uh, a viable thing. I guess one one other thing I would would add to that is. <clears throat> The market, right? Um, it's sort of the, the push-pull, the supply and demand aspect of the market. There's there's two thought leaders in the space um, of note. Um, one of them is our client. Uh, that's Martine Rothblatt. She's a, a the founder of Sirius XM Satellite Radio, and the uh, and the founder and she be the one that has that robot that becomes a person. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, so, so she's an uh, in, incredible, amazing. mind blowing in multiple ways. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Martine is a pioneer. Uh, founded Sirius X, XM Satellite Radio, um, and then founded United Therapeutics, uh, which is a pharmaceutical company. is a part-time resident of Vermont. Um, has a home in Lincoln, and uh, I believe Lincoln. Yeah, and. Um, so Martine uh, is interested, is, as a pharmaceutical company, is also interested in the, the problem of uh, organ transplantation and, and how thousands and thousands of people on the waiting list, never, or waiting list for organs never receive their organs. So um, working um, in conjunction with partners to develop uh, methods to Im improve the rate at which we can um, deliver organ transplants, right? Particularly lungs. Lung biotechnology is a, is a sub entity of uh, United Therapeutics. And this vehicle that we're uh, building um, is, uh, is purpose built to <coughs> deliver organs um, to, to hospitals um, because, simply because lung biotechnology, as one of the few public B Corps, uh, decided that they would, they would prefer to not. Uh, Increase their the carbon footprint, or contribute to the carbon footprint in, in saving lives. Like why? She just asked the question: Why would we do that? Why can't we do it uh, in, in a in a renewable energy format? So that that was the, the genesis of this. And Is it also faster than a traditional helicopter? Uh, well, it, it potentially faster in terms of point A to point B. Yeah. Yeah, because um, what we're building is what's called a VTOL, a vertical, uh, an electric VTOL, so an eVTOL, a vertical takeoff and landing. So, so basically, it, it's capable of landing on a helipad, um, taking off and, and landing vertically, but it has a wing, so it transitions to wingborne flight, so it's uh, more efficient, essentially. And that's what makes uh, that and the combination of improvements in, in battery energy density um, are, are what enable this uh, to, to be 
uh, a viable technology. What's the range? So we're designing for a 250 mile range, which is, which is actually on par with a helicopter. So the, so the helicopters that, that UT, United Therapeutics, uses now uh, is a Bell 429, which is a, um, it's a, it's a dual turbine helicopter. And what's interesting about the what's interesting about the helicopters in comparison to the eVTOL, like what what why now what 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 makes this okay? So batteries for sure, um, applications, the desire to to reduce greenhouse emissions, of which aviation is thought to be um, uh, seven to nine percent, and notably the Green New Deal. Uh, obviously, there's. There's been some uh, publicity or, or notoriety around around how aviation is, is uh, part of that, and so you know what what makes it viable is that that Bell 429, a dual redundant helicopter, is uh, is about five million dollars uh, for as a, as a as an initial price, but its operating cost at a thousand dollars an hour. Uh, as compared to what a, what the operating cost of, of an electric VTOL is anticipated, 20% of that, um, and some people think that that may even be conservative in the long run. Um, it just completely opens up a, a whole new world in terms of, of the economics. Um, and, and that's what uh, Martina and United Therapeutics saw. In addition to that, uh, Uber has also seen this, and they've said, wow, at at one fifth the operating cost of a helicopter, they actually tried um, to do an Uber service using helicopters. They've done it in um, in France and, and and I think some limited applications in the United States because they had demand for it. Um, and under certain circumstances, they could deliver uh, to that demand. But when they found out about uh, what the economics of an eVTOL were, they got really excited and they and they've poured a lot of investment into being a thought leader in the space and um, trying to move the industry forward, move the innovation forward in, in a variety of ways. But they have become a real thought leader because they're basically saying, we want to do this, we want to create. They've got a whole program that's called Uber Elevate. So they're out there leading as well. But those are just two of uh, what we see as, as nine major verticals uh, vertical markets where eVTOL will be will be useful, right? And so you you know some of these are, are pretty obvious, right? Cargo, um, the FedEx, UPS, DHL of the world will, will will find ways to create efficiency. That that's what they're, they're great at. That's their business model. Um, so you know emergency medevac government use. Um, there's there's just a there's a variety of ways that that these regional use general aviation a variety of verticals where, where these aircraft um, can and, and will be useful. The industry, the aviation industry at least, is extremely bullish on this to the, to the extent where Uber and others are saying, you know, not since World War II when we said let's, let's build, I think it was 150 or 200,000 aircraft over the, you know, in the, in the course of the war, and now that's to the point where no aircraft manufacturer makes uh, more than 1,000 Aircraft of any of any model um, anywhere in the world, uh, and so they're really they're, they're this, this understanding that um, this is not only an, an inevitable industry or, or segment of an industry, but that it's going to be uh, a real boom time for the industry. They're talking on the order of um, a one. One and a half trillion dollar business by 2040 is Morgan Stanley's latest estimate. Uh, so a massive, massive opportunity, and fantastic that it's a massive opportunity in in green tech. Uh, so, which is which is of course we're Vermont. Yeah, but we love green tech. Yeah, so. I met I met some of your crew in Essex earlier this year, and I wondered since then. So now I have the opportunity since you're doing your work out of the airport. Um, you know, in the past, we've done a lot in the legislature to support heritage aviation in their ups mm -hmm. and downs. Yep. Um, how is working with the airport in terms of allowing um, you guys to, I don't know if you need specific grounds where you've got clearance to perform tests and things. What, what's that relationship like? Well, it's, um, the, the relationship with the airport uh, has, has been excellent in terms of flexibility. 
um, and with Heritage as well. So we're currently located in a Heritage building, um, and we're uh, under under uh, we're, we're currently doing a build out in what was uh, what had become an unused hangar um, at the airport, uh, and so uh, we entered into agreement to develop that space with in conjunction with the airport. Their flexibility on that has has been fantastic, and that's sometimes what. Um, startup businesses. Uh, having been a, a start an entrepreneur here in Burlington, I've I've worked with companies um, that have been successful. Uh, Dealer.com is what brought me here. I ran sales and marketing for Dealer.com, and that was uh, a great run. And obviously, we had a great uh, exit, and things things were wonderful. And then worked with some companies that ha weren't able to get off off the off the runway, so to speak, right? Um, and so there are a lot of challenges. Uh, as a startup here uh, in Vermont, but it's and, and money is one of them because uh, attracting investment uh, dollars from outside of the state to here is one, and, and oftentimes uh, startups that are successful find that they have to leave. I'm, I'm sure you've mm -hmm. you're, you're no stranger to that storyline, right? That story arc is, has has played out. Um, it's not always money. A lot of times it's just the flexibility and people who are willing to work with you. So the, the airport has been really good and Heritage has been really good in recognizing that and saying, wow, you, you are all trying to do something amazing and you're trying to do it here and that's got to be tough. How can, how can we be of assistance? So, so allowing us to move um, has been good. With regard to flight, that has been an even bigger challenge because of the regulatory issues. Um, we've actually had to move to Plattsburgh uh, to do all of our flight testing. The FAA would not allow us to do flight testing in the state of Vermont. On what basis? On the, yeah, on the basis of our overpopulation. <laughs> um, so that's that's a real thing, um, and it varies. And and uh, you know they've been flexible. It hasn't been all bad. There are, there are good people at the FAA. But who because are, you're flying over. Yeah, because Burlington's in, yeah, because Burlington's in a in a populated area, uh, and and we we tried and, and worked with uh, Michelle to uh, to try to get that done at at Knapp State Airport, and the FAA was insistent that that Plattsburgh was the right facility for us and that we should do our things there. It, it, it's just uh, um, uh, let's uh, the, the easiest way to describe it is that the FAA does does not have universal guidelines. Some decisions like flight tests are made at a local level. And so if you're, you know, if you're, uh, yeah. It's so just, it's your FAA yeah. we've determination of local or a national? It's a, that was a, a local determination. Out of where are they located? They're located out of but, Portland. Out of Plattsburgh. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they're located out of Plattsburgh. No, and it's like, you know, there, there are good people who, who, who try to do their best within, within the constraints. However, to give you an idea and, and to not mince words, um, when we were encountering this difficulty and worked with um, various consultants, how do we work through this problem? We had certain consultants who, who said, listen, best advice I can give you is to move your company to Los Angeles now, as fast as you possibly can. Because their airspace is not crowded. Well, because they're, oh, yeah, oh, I was going to say, sorry, I was taking you too seriously. Yeah. No, that's, that's basic, that's basically the, the, the they're, because their uh, local FAA folks are like, we want innovation, we're in California, this is where innovation happens. But also because, and because their airspace is crowded and, and because Uber is working with, um, it's Los that's Angeles to be the pilot city. That, that's so important to innovation. But yeah, and that's kind of my question. Yeah. How do we, are there other, are you the only electric aviation company? I thought there was another one in Vermont, or maybe I was just thinking of you guys earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, not that I'm aware of, unless, okay. unless I'm, I'm just okay. having a brain malfunction. So you're working with the supply chain, or like you, there are other, you know, like with the chamber that is working on a whole aviation supply chain in the state, is that? Yeah, there, so there are, there are, there are a, a few companies here uh, that we work with. The former founder of MicroStrain, which was, is now part of Lord, um, is, is part of our company, Steve. Yeah, Steve Burns. Yeah. So, and, and Steve's been phenomenal for us. And so 
Um, and we work with MicroStream on, um, or, or Lord now, on a, on a variety of things. So they're, they're, um, they're a company that, that we rely on uh, for inertial measurement units and, and other technologies that help us develop uh, everything that we're doing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess that maybe it's a question for economic development more than transportation to evolve. Like, you know, what could the state do to encourage more innovation in this space and to make this a electric aviation hub of some sort? So. Yeah. There's a aviation council. What is it called? The AV, AV, AV. Caucus. No, no. It's a caucus for everything. But I remember <laughs> Ryan Doobie was the co-chair or something for some period of time. Um, bringing together places like GE and Rutland, but also a lot of smaller places that provide materials and other things. <coughs> um, but the, you know, you know, so there's been focus on you know reducing expenses. Heritage was really the primary place where the focus has been just because they were bringing in, they were employing all the people graduating from the aviation program at VTC, and so it was really good. Now the question is like this, I think what's hard is to, to know the difference between electric aviation, as you're describing, and advancements in drone technology. There's a relationship there, but yep. they're different. Um, you have a lot of people doing drone things, but that's mm -hmm. being done everywhere, yep. uh, whereas electric aviation is not a everywhere. Well, yeah, Mike and Shirley, there, Mike Shirley would fit into this. What's your reaction? I'm sorry, I was doing two things at one <laughs> okay. uh, time, Mr. Chairman. What's the question? <laughs> Economics. Uh, we've been fortunate to, to work with, uh, in particular, House Commerce for the last year on this uh, particular topic, and we drafted, uh, at their at the legislature's request, uh, a fairly brief report on uh, economic development and economic development marketing as it relates to airports and aviation. We do think that there is a, uh, we are at a unique point in time to try to capitalize on the momentum in electric aviation and innovation in aviation in general. Um, long story short, uh, between the technology that Beta is uh, deploying and the unique assets that we've got in Vermont with our nine airports plus Burlington, the unique geography that goes with that, and in particular, the proximity of our airports to one another, we could be primed to deploy a uh, a test bed for electric aviation that could attract additional manufacturers, additional research and development, um, led of course by uh, by Beta and the, I, I'll say that he's I think dramatically underselling the progress that they've made in uh, in the last 18 months in particular. Um, you know, they're, uh, from where I sit, they're leading uh, not only the development of the airframe. Uh, but the charging technology, uh, those batteries built by DynaPower in South Burlington, and uh, even the, the training uh, components. I mean, they built from the ground up a training regimen to be able to fly these aircraft that hadn't been done before either, and that's been accepted by the FAA. So ahead in every way. And important to note also from where I sit, I was a popular mechanics reader for years until I figured out that everything they put on the cover actually didn't ever exist. <laughs> These things were on the cover of Popular Mechanics through the 70s and 80s as flying cars or whatever. Those were fictional. This is real. Um, and that's really the most exciting is piece of Bombardier this. Is Bombardier still building planes in Quebec? They are, def they, they are still building planes. They're actually, I was thinking about it this morning, they're the only uh, major aerospace company that is that has does not publicly state that they're working on electric VTOL. Yeah. Do you, do you see in the future passenger planes with electric with big planes that carry 100 passengers? Or is that the future? 100 passengers? Or well, well, for sure. For oh, sure, okay. definitely. In fact, there's one startup that's that's working on that already. It's a company called Zunamero. It's it's in part funded by JetBlue Technology Ventures. Uh, they're out of Seattle, so you'd imagine some you know former Boeing folks. Um, and they're, so they're starting with uh, hybrid electric uh, systems to do smaller regional jets. So think of you know, what Delta Connection would fly in and out of Burlington to LaGuardia, that, that sort of size of, of plane um, with, with, that, with that sort of size of, of range. 
Um, but what people are also looking at is, is with the, the potential for electric aviation is, is um, smaller airports, right? We've sort of, we, we've optimized the entire sort of, you're asking sort of a global aviation question, right? We've, <coughs> we've sort of optimized to, to a pole uh, uh, along the spectrum, which is how to make it efficient for the airlines to make money, right? The airline industry has had to weather its ups and downs, and now the whole system it seems to be optimized for their profitability. And they're doing quite well. well I, guess, I think, yeah. I think <laughs> Delta made $6 billion in profit last year. Yeah, they charge year. for lots of water. Exactly. So they, they've optimized for their profitability. But what's, what's not been optimized for is, is for regional travel. There's no direct flight from here to Boston. That seems a little right. odd. And fares are usually very high for, the, for small. the shorter hauls. Exactly. So, so this is this is an area where people are, um, they see the promise of, of electric and hybrid electric as a bridge to to all electric, regional transport essentially, and we, and we see that as a as a potential, especially particularly for a state like Vermont. Um, you know, I, I met with uh, with uh, Mayor Weinberger recently, and and just to sort of bring him up to speed in a similar fashion about you know what the future may hold with EV tall is the ability to uh, you know, essentially set up a vertiport in Burlington that would pay, take people directly to Montreal in 22 minutes, directly to Stowe in 12 minutes, directly to Sugarbush in 14 minutes. That's a whole, that's a whole different world. Uh, having s uh, electric jets that take people to Rutland or to Manchester or to Boston or to Albany, that's, an, that's another. Will that happen overnight? No, of course not. It'll happen in more like in the 10 to 20 year uh, time frame. But our technology, uh, we'll be looking to deploy this technology in, in a five plus year time frame. So we're looking to certify 2023, full production by 2025, 26, and, 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 and selling. But will you sell the vehicle or you're just going to use it internally for your client to transport? So, so pre presently, I would say, you know, our, our prognosis on the industry would be, it's, a, it's too early to say exactly, um, but the early indication would be a great uh, business strategy for Beta would be to find a partner in each of those verticals uh, that we can work with. Uh, it works out great with United Therapeutics where they're a ready-made customer, they're helping us with uh, research and development funds. We, we have a long-term uh, contract with them. Uh, to develop the aircraft, and it's um, a capital source, a source of capital. Exactly. Which is yeah, not exactly. Such a critical. Oftentimes, the biggest struggle. Yeah, it's 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 an amazing it's an amazing thing for us is is that they are they are funding our company um, in in a large to a to a large degree, and so finding other partners that are similar to that, if we could just uh, you know lather, rinse, repeat over mm -hmm. across the the verticals, that would be a we we'd have a phenomenal business here. Um, and so that, that to us looks like a great One of the, um, and I know the genesis of this whole thing, it was the consolidation of rail and air and the extent to which the state and the agency would really promote and understand the connection between um, our airports as a resource and uh, an important part of economic development. Um, the airport in Burlington, of course, isn't owned by the state. Um, we have smaller airports scattered around, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, and um, my, uh, what I'm wondering is, do you, how do you see sort of the emerging technology as it would relate to um, those state-owned assets um, as well? What well, NAP would be one of them. Of yeah, exactly. So in the, in, in the scenario that I, that I was just speaking of with a much lower uh, cost per hour to operate these vehicles and with the ability to carry four, five, six passengers, travel around the state via this means is realistic. Um, and then the question is, okay, that's that's more of a longer term. Is, is it what is there is there a worthy investment in the shorter term? Um, and there are and, and our position unsurprisingly would be yes, there there is uh, a shorter term usage as uh, as was just referenced. What we would what we would love to see is the state invest in electric charging infrastructure that would allow Beta to have a test network 
uh, but that would also allow for the aviation industry uh, in, in Vermont uh, to be able to grow the number of uh, training, training companies, pilots, and so forth, because what's happening with really the first implementation of electric aircraft are these electric trainers. There's a few companies that are already producing mm. electric training aircraft. So because those become so much cheaper then the cost of uh, the cost of training pilots comes way down, and uh, the ability for people to enter a flight school uh, goes up. And then, of course, those become uh, a tourist destination, uh, a way to you know uh, imagine. You know, we don't do a lot of that. We uh, think of how how busy our state is in October uh, for leaf peeper season, um, and and if that's a, a viable option where people can. And do those type of tours? Uh, I think that's a. That's are there, are there any states that have certainly kind of proactively come up with legislation governing the use of uh, state airports or public facilities for these purposes? I'm just. We were just discussing, uh, you know, policies around, uh, you know, automatic automated vehicles, mm -hmm. road vehicles. Yeah and On anticipating the future, and so the same issues uh, mm -hmm. raise their heads, perhaps uh, irrationally, but um, with the public when it comes to aviation, right, the idea if they're going to think, oh my god, it's a untested or, or a new stage technology flying over neighborhoods on the way from Burlington to Rutland, you know, the percentage crash, like they, people are going to imagine things. Yeah, so is there any state that has tried to come up with a preemptive set of strategies to allow for innovation while also managing people's perceptions? Yeah. Yeah. We're not aware of, of any states that are in this realm yet. Uh, we do have a very preliminary draft uh, piece of legislation that uh, Chairman Marcotte has um, at his request that would uh, start to clear a path for the development of um, the electrified charge between ACCD and VTRANS and other state partners that we get those permits in hand to be able to offer space but at state airports to some the permits that would be needed to be kind of combined all of them no but for um, for the use of say Rutland or something what it depends which agency you talk to and which parcel on a particular piece of property. Everything from wetlands to uh, to stormwater no, what, to what Act 250. What I'm missing to, is if he wants to fly to Rutland because the FAA says it's okay for him to fly, but what on the receiving end in Rutland needs to be permitted in, in this discussion? In this case, the, the charging point? station. Yeah. Is that permitted or just funded? Do we have to permit a charging station? In some instances, yes. I mean, it depends on the footprint. Are you creating more pervious surface? Is there a fire safety permit required from an electrician standpoint? How I mean, big is the charging station? Well, the, the smallest implementation would be about um, 50 by 50. You know, uh, a little bit more than that, actually. But uh, but but picture picture a helipad. Yeah. It's 50 by 50, and then you, our our initial prototype has a little bit more structure than that because you, you take your power electronics and your generator and so forth outside of that for Well, we would love to have you in Rutland. <laughs> we have plenty of space and open to do business. <laughs> and you have already got the impervious And you know service. someone who yeah. Yeah. have a good deal on uniforms. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Very affordable. <laughs> Michelle, is there anything in the budget for charging stations at airports? No, there is not. What do they cost? What do they <laughs> Hard, hard, to, hard to put a, a price tag on it because it really the main cost comes down to how much how much energy you're bringing in and and how much uh, battery you would have there if you decide to have battery in other words is it are you are you storing energy there um, or are you just connecting the grid to to be able to charge there it's it's but so, so our initial prototype the the idea is to build a recharge pad for about a million dollars that would go at a, that would be located at a hospital. So if we were to be putting one in at UVM Medical, we'd be saying, okay, here it is, plus siting, it's gonna be $1.2 million. If, uh, I, I think it's probably helpful to understand that that's uh, 
more of a boutique solution, right? That, that you, you, you've got a limited footprint, you gotta have a lot of power on hand, therefore a lot of batteries, because you can't be loitering at a, at a hospital. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. We actually have hotel units in those, so we've, we're building out uh, crew quarters into those um, so that if, uh, because if they get stranded, you know, on a day like today, they break, come in with organs and then they can't get back out, so they'd have to stay there. So that's a, that's a pretty elaborate plan um, for a recharging station. We, ha we haven't designed one that would just be uh, for, uh, for example, a state airport. Because it could be, it could be as simple as, as pulling uh, power onto the airport. Uh, and, and then getting the right connections and capacity. I but that's still would, expensive. Yeah, and I think we probably would want um, a battery system built in so that we're pulling power at the most economical time uh, and not... Not, um, not just when they show up. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a great... There's a, there's a, there's a phenomenal uh, opportunity with these two because it, it helps to lower uh, the, the peaks uh, because, you know, when we put in them, so we're working with Green Mountain Power on... Um, essentially, grid tied energy storage allows them to to pull from from our facilities at peak times. Those those few those few points where they save a lot of money by, by lowering their peaks. So, so they're excited about it. Dyna Power. So so they're uh, I, I only know a little bit about what they do. They create these big boxes that basically hold power, and then their innovation they convert power. Yeah, they convert it's, power, and then and then they're. I, I don't know if this was um, five years dated now, but then part of the vision was that they would then be able to release it to the grid when needed. So it was a very smart box. Exactly. Um, is that what how they're working with you guys on the big box? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our founder, Kyle Clark, um, was was part of the team that designed that. He's actually, the, those are some patented devices that are now deployed by Tesla's commercial recharging operations that they've done massive scale uh, in, in Australia, for example, um, but yeah, so they've got that. That is exactly the, the idea there. So you've you've got battery capacity there that's on hand, charges aircraft, but it can also be uh, grid tied for for load leveling. Cool. Is there any language that is going to be proposed in this year's bill, like? just to keep it alive and well, or is that what you're looking for? I think we're going to, uh, Secretary Sherling mentioned the language that uh, we were talking about relative to a master permitting framework for state airports and how to how to get that in place um, to be a, a first start. And so um, we may look to include that as we move forward and make the transportation bill. I would recommend that uh, both to you and, and to Secretary Sherling that as soon as you have something that's at least, if it's not already, but the moment something's ready to be shared without, you know, all the wrinkles that you <clears throat> wish you could pull back, to go to a series of committees, at least preliminarily, because around here, crossover, crossover becomes this sort of absurd date where a policy committee who might throw in things that affect 10 other committees are like, oh, but we made crossover. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, but the committee that actually focuses on permits, whether it be transportation or natural resources, hasn't seen it. Then it comes to here with like four weeks left in the session. It can go to Senate Economic Development, linger there for three weeks, and then they meet crossover, and then we've got two committees here. So the sooner some people see it, so it doesn't create an alarm factor where people are saying, oh my god, we haven't had enough time, and it's too late, and all that. I just so ran you exciting concept. I mean, I hadn't heard about it. So, well, it's become an issue as our Commerce and the economic development committees over the last decade have increasingly put permit issues in. Mm -hmm. And it's not that things shouldn't maybe originate there from time to time, but if the, the clock management means that when committees do these massive omnibus bills and then at the last second spit it out, push it. A lot of times things get yanked because no one's had a chance to see it, not on the merits necessarily. So it's just an encouragement to thank you. Oh, I don't care what you do with the House committees, but the two Senate yeah, committees, right, yeah. that's where I'm really focusing on. <laughs> well, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Oh. Very exciting. So yeah, the presentation was the best, yeah. I, I do drive a Tesla, yeah. <clears throat> I, I was lucky enough to, uh, I got a new, I, I just got my second Tesla, and um, it arrived in January, and I didn't have my snow tires on. So luckily, I got them on yesterday and was able to come up here. <laughs> Otherwise, 
you wouldn't have seen my face today. <laughs> they're not all wheel drive, they're just front wheel drive. It is all there, it's all, all wheel drive. Yeah. That's why Peter took longer to get it. You have to have winter tires. Oh, yeah. Yeah, really? Yeah. Yeah. You don't have winter tires? No, I'll just run all wheel drive. Really? All, all, yeah, all seasons. Yeah, all seasons. No, no problem. Once you got all this run of first years, I've done snow tires. Well, yeah. one of the things is that you, when you, uh, they'll use a, a low rolling resistance tire because people are so acutely attuned to range that they'll use a very, they, and when I, when I brought it into to Nate's Automotive in Essex, they're like, you're ready to get those slicks off? They call them right. slicks yeah. because there's, there's almost no tread on them because they just want yeah. to maximize oh, the range. Okay. So once yeah. the snow comes, you better get your snows on. Oh, that's uh, different. That's so wonderful. Yeah. Usually, if you got all wheel drive, you don't have to have a yeah. tire. One, one of the amazing things, just to leave you with a thought, is that you know when I was at Tesla, uh, I started there in 2006, and I, and I worked there until 2009 when I when I came out to work at dealer.com. I had like a two-hour commute back and forth across the bay, and so moving to Vermont just yeah. sounded like, and it's been great. Um, raised four kids here and. and of the state. I actually, not to, to go on and on, but I actually ran a summer camp in Randolph oh my God. for four years when I first got out of college and I thought to myself, I would love to live here, but what would I ever do? <laughs> you know, like, how would I make a living? Yeah. So here I am uh, 30 years later. But the, but the, um, <clears throat> but the thing about uh, Tesla was that um, everyone was saying exactly the same things. You could almost just switch out planes and cars uh, in the in the news articles that came out back then about oh it'll never work and this is such a dream and now we have our our new wave of of, of U.S. Congress people basically saying we're gonna outlaw combustion engines by 2030. It's only been 10 years and now we're already talking about so so when we talk about the reality of of electric aviation. There are definitely, you, 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 you will find your skeptics, but they were, they're the same kind of skeptics 10 years ago about electric cars. Oh, it'll never happen. You know, the batteries are never going to be there. And, and, and here we are. Were you so, with Tesla with the same owner as of today? Is he, is he Elon same? Musk? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did. I did. Is he up and down or all over the place or something? <laughs> yeah. he's, he's, um, he's a frenetic individual. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, when you've got that much brain power going, it tends to. It tends to, uh, yeah. But it, it was it was good to work with him. Uh, worked with him in the beginning. Worked with the original founder. Most people think that he was the founder. No, he was the founder. No, Martin Eberhard was the founder, and Elon came in because he, you know things weren't weren't going according to plan. They couldn't bring the the, the price down. Um, but but I think I think the thing is with Kyle and this team. I'm a business person, sales, marketing. I'm not an engineer. I'm the only person on the team who's not an engineer. This group of engineers that we have here is as good as any group of engineers, 20, 20 folks that I've worked with out in Silicon Valley, where I was for close to 10 years. Wow. Uh, this is an amazing group. It, it, it could very well be um, the best uh, assemblage of people, and, and people who are working for free out of the gates, simply working for equity, people who have founded companies, uh, it's really a phenomenal, phenomenal group of people, um, and 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 Kyle right on down the line can can hold a candle uh, to you know anything that's <coughs> happening uh, in in California. And when people come from California to to visit, they're blown away. We had we had a group in from the West Coast yesterday, um, a, a potential investment group. They're a potential partner investor. They're looking at the space, um, and they left with their jaws down, saying, "We had no idea that you've come this far." Maybe that's you know my my underselling the thing, <laughs> okay. but it's it really is it really is um, yeah. I'm I'm sort of like just I'm amazed and, and happy to be part of the ride. We as could the, make you part of our marketing plan. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are. How many people are here? We have twenty. We have twenty-five people right now. Yeah, we have twenty-five. And since we've been publicized over the past year or over the past month, we were in Wired. Mm -hmm. We've received applications from people. Oh, yeah, we were we were featured in Wired on January tenth, and then again uh, about a week ago. Those articles are on our website. 
We've received uh, inquiries from people all over the country. We've already hired uh, half a dozen people to move and who have moved to Vermont from from big companies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah.